a hot DC tip. <laughs> um, great. Well, welcome to day two. I'm uh, really excited to have the discussions that we have planned today. Um, I'm going to start with the recording disclaimer again. Um, this meeting is being recorded and will be published on the EV Working Group group page within DriveLondering.gov. If you do not wish to have your voice recorded, please do not speak during the meeting. If you do not wish to have your image recorded, please turn off your camera or speak by phone. If you speak during the call or use a video connection, you are presumed to consent to recording and use of your image or voice. Um, great. So with that done, uh, we're just going to quickly review the agenda and then I'll pass it to uh, Rachel, who will give us uh, the safety briefing again. Um, and some meeting logistics. Uh, but today we are really excited to start fleshing out a little bit more of the what, what we wanna do as a group together. So we had a secretary's charge yesterday. Um, we got some really interesting discussions started, I would say, um, and this would be an opportunity to continue them. Um, we had the meeting before this virtually, where we compiled a lot of uh, different ideas on uh, what people thought are the priorities coming into this EV working group. And now it's our, our time to start scoping out how, how we start working on those things together. We identified three areas, uh, medium and heavy duty electrification, grid integration, and uh, the charging network. And then we have three cross cuts that we think are, are really important, um, equity, uh, workforce, and supply chain. Um, so I think we, today we're gonna really break out into those subcommittees. We, I, I think agreed for the most part on, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about reports and, and deadlines and things um, in the upcoming sessions. Um, but the, the proposal was to, get an idea of what we wanted to work on, flush it out a little bit further. And then the first report we would have is actually a summary of what we plan to work on together. So that first report is due in January. So you can understand why, why we have an urgency to try to put something in writing. But I think it's actually a really good kind of best practice that as we're coming together, as we're as we're pulling this all together, we're able to communicate more publicly about what we're what we're planning on working on together. Um, so this session today, um, the, pretty much the full day, is really built around flushing those ideas a little bit out, um, and and then giving us some fodder for that initial report that I think will be relatively short, but kind of a summary of of what we all need to get out of uh, at least the initial charge of this EV work. And I will um, call back to the charge. I sent it around an email last night, um, but I, I think we really want to be quantitative here. Um, we want metrics. Um, we want goals. We want milestones. We want to work collaboratively together. So I think there's an element of quantification for all of these topics, all of these cross cuts, but also how do we work together as industry and government together? Because we do have this unique opportunity in this federal advisory committee where we have government members actually on the committee. Um, so I think this is just an opportunity for us to, to really um, roll up our sleeves together um, and, and come up with some plans that will get us to uh, an electrified transportation system. Um, so with that, uh, I will, so does anyone have questions actually about the agenda for today? Um, you should have it in front of you if you don't have extras here. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more in depth about, I'll, I'll show the figures and we'll review the charge again um, after, after the security briefing and logistics. Um, maybe have a, a short discussion. Um, we are gonna have an activity where we write down the top priorities for each one of the focus areas. Um, and we have three people that are, are leading those focus areas, those discussions right now. And the purpose of uh, writing down the ideas first is that we want everyone to contribute to all ideas first um, and then once we start scoping out in a little bit more depth, we'll come back, we'll report out what those, uh, what that scoping exercise produced, um, and then we'll also have a discussion about that. So nobody should feel like, you know, they're 
they're dedicated to a focus area, although if they want to dedicate themselves early to a focus area, totally, totally get that. We can, we can uh, uh, accommodate that. Uh, but I think right now, since we don't know what we're committing to yet, uh, right now it's just the scoping. Well, with that, I will pass it to Rachel for logistics. Right. Good morning, everyone. It feels strange to be sitting down um, instead of uh, standing as a facilitator. Uh, but just to recap where we are, you're now familiar with, um, with this conference space. But in case of emergency, please exit and go down the hallway to the front entrance that you came in at. If we need to shelter in place, please stay here and await further instruction. Um, I assume you know where the restrooms are. Take a right down the hallway and then also uh, the hallway leading to the exit. Um, and then when we do have our breakouts, one group will be staying here and two will be going to conference rooms in the department and we'll be escorting you there. So just keep that in mind. When we do the breakouts, we'll tell you who to follow um, and it'll be important to stay with that group. Um, so at this point, just again to uh, review the ground rules, um, for those here, um, if we do need to speak, especially when we have Q&A as the breakouts report out, please continue to turn your table tent vertically. Uh, for those, I believe we're just going to have one uh, remote working group member, Michael, joining us shortly. So uh, we'll look to our colleagues to let us know uh, when he needs to uh, chime in and he'll raise his hand. And we can also, we'll be including him in the breakout discussion. And then for those uh, joining us today from the public on Zoom, you are muted. Um, but again, you can chat the um, hosts if you have technical difficulties. And then during the public comment period, um, like in our virtual meeting, we'll hear from everyone and give those uh, public members who raise their hands the opportunity to unmute at that time. So I think that covers our, our morning review, and then I'll be back shortly uh, so we can have fun with the index cards and lead into our breakout discussion. Great. Thanks. Well, let's maybe get into a little bit more of the details of kind of building out this framework. Um, so maybe just a, a reorientation of where we are. Um, so we were stood up in the bipartisan infrastructure law as the EV working group. Um, it was established uh, shortly in FACA terms after, the, after that. And then uh, we uh, got the membership together in August of this year. Um, we had our first meeting in September. And now we're kind of in the, the, the real meat of this FACA where we have the legislative direction to meet every 120 days, so about every quarter. Um, so this is our, our meeting for the end of the year. Um, and we will we intend to meet um, in about three months' time. Um, we'll have a discussion a little bit later about you know if there are any events or things that we might want to consider uh, people are already going to and we might want to convene around those or if there are any um, you know holidays that are that people are taking that we should take into consideration. So we do have some flexibility on the, the time that we schedule this um, in three months. So we'll have a little bit of that logistical discussion at the end. Um, we do have our first report due um, in January. This, we expect to be a high level uh, roadmap and update of our priorities. So we'll be really an output of this conversation today. Um, we expect that's probably going to be a heavy lift on um, the staff side um, to kind of put it all in writing that you guys would then review it, make comments. You know, we would re reconcile those comments, but because of the, the quick deadline, um, we want to try to uh, execute that relatively relatively quickly. Um, but if anyone is really interested in uh, putting pen to paper, uh, we would be happy to have the support with that. Um, and then after that, we have, I would say, kind of an open agenda. So we, we legislatively have to produce two more reports, but those are due every two years. Um, I've also heard some other uh, Federal Advisory Committee models where um, they actually do some, some quick turnaround requests. And you know something will come from 
uh, leadership of one of the agencies and say, you know, we want to know the industry's perspective on X. And then three months later, the EV working group produces a memo on X of their, their thoughts. So there's a lot of different ways that we can do it. I think in the initial meeting, we also discussed, you know, how do we, how do we engage the subcommittees in a way that we can get more people involved because this is not only a whole of government effort to get to, to transportation electrification, but a whole of stakeholder. Um, you guys are representatives of that, but obviously there's a lot of other people that are doing a lot of work in this area um, that we weren't able to have joined the EV working group. So how do we kind of engage the right uh, stakeholders? Um, and so there's also, you know, presentations and we can think about what, what kind of formats we have to deliver the types of messages that we want to get to the government because ultimately the Federal Advisory Committee is for industry to advise and provide recommendations to the government. Um, so we have those, those two reports, but I, I'm hopeful that the reports are more of a box checking and that we will just have lots of really robust discussions and products that uh, those reports will, will just be, you know, almost an afterthought that we, we have a lot of work to do ahead of us. Um, and so uh, we, will, we will work together on a variety of, of products. Any questions, thoughts? Yeah, um, the, a slide like this, some of the slides that we saw yesterday, are they going to be put on the EWG <coughs> page? Yes. Okay. Yep. Rachel, All right. can I? Yeah, absolutely, Michael. Um, just want to reemphasize one one point that Rachel made there. The you know this working group will be going on now for uh, for a while uh, in the years, we'll, we'll all get to know each other. Certainly the, the reports that we got to do are, you know, are key things we have to deliver. But uh, as Rachel said, we don't want the group to think that is their only, on, only way to provide input. Um, and, you know, really this group, as the secretary said, they gave the charge to this group. That is what they, um, you know, want to hear, need to hear. And if at any point we have in key input from this group, uh, the group has to kind of vote on it as a, as a group, I believe, by back of rules. Uh, but if this group's at any point in two months says, we want to deliver this or three months, we want to get this message across, or we have an initial thought on one perspective that we think is really important, um, that, that can be delivered up again at any time and is something that uh, other FACAs do and is, is definitely encouraged. <laughs> Yeah, and um, I, I don't want to casually say that the legislative requirements are an afterthought. <laughs> just just want to make sure that we are delivering things that, to Michael's point, are you know things that the government can take action on. We want to take action on this. We want to work with industry. We want to uh, do the best we can to work together. And so. Um, you know, reports are one way to do that, and we will absolutely meet those those milestones, those deadlines. Um, but we want to also make sure that we're that things are a little bit more dynamic than just putting things in reports. I will say one one last uh, logistical thing is that uh, at the end of the second report, that is actually when the EV working group. Um, disperses. So there is actually an end date in the legislative language. We get every two years to write a report and then after the, the last report the EV working group um, ends. Mike. So are we going to talk today any more about the subcommittees or is that something that will, um, there are a lot of people applied for these. Uh, yep. <laughs> so there's a, I think there's probably a keen interest out there. I'm just curious what the ground rules and guidelines are going to be for subcommittees. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the important things to know about the subcommittees is that we are able to engage a, a broader set of stakeholders. Um, they are not technically EV working group members, and any products that the subcommittees um, develop need to be approved by the EV working group in order to be submitted as you know, federal advice, right, um, recommendations to the government. Um, but I do think, Mike, that um, 
we got, you know, we had almost 300 applications for the EV Working Group membership. We've got over 200 people on this call today. So I think there's a lot of engagement. Um, and I think there's also people that we might want to engage that weren't um, specifically called out in the representation as well. Um, you know, NGOs, for example, were not called out in representation, and so, um, and they're doing a lot of really great work in the electrification space, so that might be an opportunity. The subcommittees will be an opportunity to bring people in, get more input um, on specific topics, I would say. You know, we don't want to um, have it be too unwieldy, which is um, why we uh, were kind of headed towards this initial framework. And again, this, uh, there's a lot of different models. We could, we could say that um, subcommittees will produce reports, but we could also say, you know, if, if a, like I said, a, a secretary or someone says, I want the EV working group's input on X, and it doesn't fall into one of these categories, that's totally okay. We're the EV working group, not, not married to this framework. This is just a way for us to start organizing ourselves and um, figuring out what we want to spend our, our time on, what the priorities are of this group. Um, so maybe just walking through this a little bit further, unless others have questions. Yeah, Sarah. Quick comment I wanted to make on that. I'm Sarah Emmons, the operations manager for the joint office and the uh, deputy designated federal official for the PACA. I just wanted to let people know that uh, the subcommittees are able to meet without the formal process of creating a federal register notice and making that meeting public. So they are a more nimble way to um, coordinate and you, you are able to meet without requiring that those meetings be public. Uh, also, uh, subcommittees are able to interview outside, of court, uh, outside entities, so that's something that you're able to do as well. And we can provide you additional guidance on that. Yep. Yeah, so um, I know in that initial meeting we talked a little bit about the time frame and, you know, that the charge of this group is not not to sort of try to change anything that's in practice, like, you know, NAVI, right, not to try to change anything, but to, to look a little further. But I did have a question about if we identify, you know, really critical gaps or areas where we think there could be a role for the federal government um, that is more in the here or in the short term, can those be a part of the, the recommendations or goals, right? Something that is essentially um, not covered by existing programs that we think needs to be addressed, even if it's in the shorter term. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you guys are our advisory committee, right? So it's up to you to decide what you want to recommend to the government. Um, we might want to have conversations, especially since we have federal representation on the EV working group. We might want to have conversations about um, what is reasonable and realistic for the government to take action on, right? Um, because we want to be able to take action on these recommendations ultimately, right? And so we don't want to have this like great brain trust here uh, putting in a lot of effort and work to deliver something that then we're not able to execute. So I would say it's, it's probably a little bit of a balance, um, but absolutely we want to hear from, from you all what, what is um, advised by, by industry. Um, yeah. Also, just a quick question looking at the statute. It uh, looks like there is option to get help from the Transportation Research Board. Yes. Is that something that you guys are looking into? Or? We did explore that a little bit on the logistical end early and um, we kind of paused that um, since we were able to secure um, excellent support as I hope you guys all think from the Volpe Center. Um, and but we have kind of uh, an open line to Transportation Research Board um, and the National Academies in general just to say like okay you guys are also working on reports and things about transportation decarbonization this work this group is going to as well so let's make sure that we're at least coordinating um, you know not duplicating work and figuring out how we can work together on these things so I think the TRV tie is probably a little bit more substantive um, and so once we have more of our substance fleshed out I think it'd be a great idea to re-engage with them on on what partnership could look like thanks for bringing that up yeah. great 
Um, so maybe uh, walking through this a little bit more, uh, we have the, the three topical areas that we identified early on. Um, we, we could share the poll results with you guys. It, it was very clear. These were the top three. Grid integration, medium and heavy duty, and charging network. Kind of to talk to Laura's point a little bit, these probably are happening in different timelines as well. So I want to encourage people when they divide out into their subcommittees that you're talking about like what might the near-term actions be versus like how do we get to a roadmap, a, you know, a shared set of goals or milestones um, in the longer term because obviously grid integration is going to take a, a much longer time um, than maybe some of the, the near-term uh, work that's happening with the charging network. So uh, I, think, I think there are uh, different ways that we can look at this, and so I, I would really encourage people to have a robust discussion in their subcommittees about timing. Um, I do think that probably aligns then with you know, how we roll out our products, how we roll out reports. Um, and so uh, I, I, that's just something to, to be aware of. Uh, we also identified, um, I think Henrik actually had this initial idea where we had these kind of cross cuts with these topical areas. Um, and we have equity, workforce, and supply chain that are highlighted as important things that we want to identify ways to work together and uh, metrics around all of those for each one of the topical areas. So a charging network product, whether it be a report, whether it be a presentation, whether it be a memo to the secretaries, uh, we want that charging network to take into consideration um, the equitable distribution of the charging network, you know, how we are supporting the workforce uh, that will build and maintain that EV charging network, um, and the supply chain, what are the constraints right now, um, how do we start identifying solutions. I do think, going back to the uh, secretary's charge, we want actionable recommendations and we want solutions. We want to know ways that we can work together. Um, and I think a really important key part of that is uh, identifying who's going to take the action, right? Like we can have a, a lot of really great actions, but the government might, might be able to do some things really well and industry might be able to do other things very well. And so how do we, how do we kind of piece together um, all, of, uh, all of that work? All right. So any questions? Um, I also would say, you know, this is our working group. So we can wordsmith this. I want to make sure that everyone is feeling comfortable with the words on this slide. This will be, I think, the basis for that initial report. Um, so anything that comes uh, out of uh, developing this uh, is, is important. So I think every word on here should be very intentional. Um, people should sign off on it and feel really comfortable with it. So I just, I sent out the, the initial draft early, but I think as we're starting to think about um, the subcommittees and fleshing out the scope a little bit more, we might want to update the wording uh, some. Um, this is great and it's very logical. I would just submit that I think there's a big missing piece, maybe right in the middle, which is cost or affordability, and that that as as this has been you know well thought through and well laid out, that that is an overarching yes. and cross cutting and everything <laughs> yes. in here, and so um, would make a recommendation that it be incorporated in some way. Absolutely. So maybe this is, um, so we, we just debuted the secretary's charge. I do see that as a metric, right? Affordability as, as part of, um, you know, how we measure ourselves in the EV uh, ecosystem. Um, but let's talk about how we might be able to integrate now the secretary's charge maybe into this figure more visually, or maybe there's a separate figure that, that kind of talks more about the secretary's charge. But I, I agree with you. I think affordability. We also heard life cycle assessment and emissions. Um, I think we also heard um, uh, what were some of the other ones. I don't think if anyone wants to jump in on some of the metrics that we think we want to. It's less of a metric, Rachel, but I will say one comment that, that I've heard a lot from folks in my area is 
they question why cybersecurity is not on this. And even though I've said that was discussed and it's going to be incorporated, I actually think it goes to some of the um, issues that you know we talked about yesterday about trust. I think even just putting the word secure, maybe under charging network and grid integration could address that. Um, I think we should consider that. Just even using that word, um, it shows that that is a core consideration. And I think that's really critical. Um, anyone else? Uh, let's see, Nadia, John, and then Mayor. So, echo affordability and cybersecurity. What I was thinking too is some of the sub terms to like sustainable. In my mind, that's resilient, that's secure, um, that's affordable, right? For it to be sustainable. So, I think one other as we're working through this today and beyond is how do we define some of these terms? So uh, had some similar thoughts and perhaps even, you know, thinking about some of the cross cuts, maybe expressly calling out those words, but just share echoing that kind of uh, thought for one potential approach there. Yeah. And I, I do think that um, to metrics and some of the overarching things, it's probably going to be different in different areas. Right, um, and, and I think how we define it is really important. Yeah, I, I just uh, I think the metrics are critically important. I think this is a sort of a high level point of view about the working group, right? And I think that the conversations that we're having about affordability that's a critical metric. The conversation we're having about cyber and data access, those types of things, I think all come out of the work we're going to do. I get, I get a little bit worried if we're going to add a lot of verbiage to this. Because what's going to happen is the more you add to this, the more obvious certain things are that are left out. This is really a good high level framework. And I think the work that we're talking about now, cyber critical affordability, absolutely, probably one of the most important metrics I can think of at the integration of the charging network in the vehicle, cyber at the inter intersection of, of charging network in the vehicle. Like, I think that has to work out through the working groups. Um, and then we can come back and take another look at this. Yep. Because some things may rise to the top, yep. and some, but, but I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing the working groups tackle some of these things. Mayor Giles? I, I love this. It's, it's well done, and it's clear, and it, I think it does a great job of summarizing what our priorities are. Um, this is what happens when a smart person sits down and creates you know, a yep. good work product. And then you hand it to a committee, <laughs> hanging Christmas ornaments on it, and after a while, it's incomprehensible. Uh, so I, I, I hope I, uh, this this feedback is important, but at the same time, I hope it doesn't create a, a work product that's not as good as what we started with. So uh, having said that, that the the secretary's charge I thought was really great, but and and it it, it told us that our our purpose in being here is you know to facilitate the widespread vehicle, widespread vehicle uh, electrification, the adoption of that technology. But again, I, I kind of reflect back on on yesterday's uh, presentation from J.D. Powers. That's happening, right? I mean, so I think we're, we're here to solve a problem that is not a problem. The country is adopting electric vehicles. Uh, that's going to happen, and, and, and industry is adopting electric vehicles. So the, the, the part of the, the secretary's charge that I really found the most uh, important is, is the final phrase. We're here to do that in a way that accomplishes the public good. And so I think that that's a, a nice overarching uh, thing to remind ourselves of is, you know what, this is happening. That you know The cow is out of the barn. We are headed towards electrification. Adaptation is not a huge problem, you know, uh, but at the end of the day, are we going to be glad that we did this? Or are we going to do it, and are we going to look back on it, back on it and say, "Well, man, that wasn't a huge mistake. We accomplished our goals." So I would just love to see my my two cents is if we could slip that overarching, "Let's do this in a way that accomplishes the public good." That would be a little uh, comforting to me. I was going to comment on the metrics, but I'm not sure if I should offer my Christmas ornaments. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really liked uh, Nadia's comments. 
with respect to the sustainability theme. I think there are a lot of uh, ESG relevant metrics that we can consider as part of this activity. Uh, just to, you know, we I offered a couple via email which were related to cost of ownership and life cycle assessment. But in general, a big topic for batteries or electrification is circular economy and the raw materials and the human rights component of it. So again, I agree that we don't have to plaster everything on this one slide, but it could be part of our, the metrics and the working groups. The subcommittees can prioritize which ones to go at. But very relevant for our cause here. Yeah, maybe um, just if I could mention um, so we've talked already a little bit about TRV doing similar things. I think industry is also doing some similar things in, in all of these areas. The states are doing similar things in all of these areas. We uh, even heard from Michael the different modal uh, roadmaps that DOP is working on in coordination with um, an interagency group. Um, so I think that that stuff is the stuff that is right for subcommittees, right? That's what we want to invite the right people to give presentations to inform then what our thinking is, what our recommendations would be, where the gaps are for industry and government to fill. So I just want to note that there, that um, we've got a lot of great people here, but uh, our collective uh, value is more than just the people in the room. It's us times all the people in our networks that we can bring in to um, e elevate, highlight good work that's already happening and coordinate with it over, over the life of the CV working group. Um, one thing I just wanted to add was to what extent government should be involved in how in supporting consumer education and awareness. I know it was discussed yesterday, but in the spirit of trying to get this network out as efficiently as possible, is there a role for the government and industry to work together to raise that awareness? And I'm not quite sure where that fits on the chart, if anywhere, but something to add. Yeah, I thought it was a really great discussion yesterday. Um, and definitely something worth exploring because I do think there's a, a really important who has what role aspect to that conversation. Um, I think Chair Mallory actually was the one that brought up, you know, government can tout from the mountaintops <laughs> that this is the right thing to do um, or this is, uh, you know, the best outcome for this. It's not even the right thing to do, right? Um, but it could fall on deaf ears if it's, you know, not presented the right way, not messaged the right way, not coming from the right people. Um, so I do think there's there's a, an element of who does what um, that is really important for consumer awareness. Mark? The chair was also talking about the trust. Mm -hmm. The government is not necessarily the most trusted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, John's point about the why, right? We, the why is kind of subtle. And what I get a little confused about is, uh, uh, you know, we spending a lot of time, what, I think, on the what, but really it's the how. I know for, from yeah. Crystal, Vicki, and I's perspective, we're, we're right now trying to turn over 600,000 vehicles, and it's very much about the how. Um, and so, that, you know, in other words, are the subcommittees right now trying to lay out what it is we're going to do? And then the next part is how we're going to do it uh, in terms of sequencing. Yeah, I think we have to agree on a scope first okay. and then figure out who wants to be involved in those conversations and then start fleshing out what what the you know, goals, metrics, and actionable recommendations might be. So yes, I agree. I think we need to get to how very quickly. Um, I think there's, there's an urgency that we heard by such high-level leadership being being here, period, right? Like, there's an urgency. You guys all know the urgency as well. You are all here as well. You have day jobs, right? Um, so I, I do think we need to get to the how very quickly. And I, I agree. I think, uh, I think Mayor Giles, you said yesterday, we're winning hearts and minds, right? And I think we are on the right path there. 
but we still have a lot of technical things to work out. We need to figure out how this is all going to work together. You know, what's really striking to me is Elizabeth talked about how um, how the Tesla network is um, so reliable, 97% reliability. Well, that's great, but that's what happens when you design and engineer a vehicle to work with the EV equipment or the EV charging equipment, right? Um, it's going to work every time, um, but now we're opening that up and we're trying to figure out the interoperability aspect of more vehicles, more charging equipment. So things like that, how we do that, how the government does it, how industry works together to make that work is really important. Um, and I think the devil's in the details. So I think getting to the how is really, really important really fast. Crystal, uh, Crystal John, Kofi. Yeah, I, I really appreciate this conversation, and I appreciate um, all of the uh, discussion about outcome metrics, and um, as well as sort of uh, metrics that will help us assess along the way what how our progress is going. Um, and uh, and um, and really appreciate the comment uh, from Mary to the public good, uh, because that's, that's that's why I'm here. <laughs> uh, and and Mark mentioned trust as well, so. Uh, um, I think one of the things that we want to, uh, you know, thinking of all those things together, I think one of the things that I want to make sure happens um, and, uh, and and open to any kind of conversation about how we get there, but um, some sort of standard experience across the board, right? So that if you are an EV owner or driver, uh, that you, you are having a similar experience every time you pull up to a charging station anywhere in the country. Um, and, and that, I think, is what is going to start to change hearts and minds. It's going to start to bring more trust um, that, that somebody's paying attention, right, and that, and that you have um, someone kind of watching to make sure that, oh, this is, this is, that it is going to be a, uh, something that's for public good. So uh, thinking about that experience and influence that experience and how we get to uh, that some, some, some experience that's more standardized across, um, across the board. Kofi, John, and I think then we're going to wrap because I misread the TikTok and we are a little bit over. Um, but back. we will have some time to move to the different rooms. Um, and Rachel will pass out the index cards so that you guys can start jotting down your thoughts on each one of the subcommittees. Uh, but Kofi, please. Uh, yeah, thanks, Rachel. I think uh, it would be helpful for me at least to have a sort of like a curated list of a lot of the research and initiatives that, mm -hmm. like that you're saying, are, are maybe underway or about to be underway. Because we could kind of include that in our subtopics, for example, and understand, you know, you know, they expect, expect like what deliverables might be available to, to us, yep. you know, while we, but I, I don't, I would love to like take that on myself. I just don't, I'm not sure where to start. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's a good point, Kofi. I do think we want to do a little bit. So I think this is a bit cyclical. Um, I think we need to spend a little bit of time of scoping out what these things mean to us. Um, and then we can start pulling in more of the resources, get some of that foundational um, knowledge that we can share among us. Um, and then we'll have to stay on top of it because this is a dy dynamic area. A lot of people are working on it. So, you know, we'll probably request um, presentations from uh, the government agencies, but also industry on their products that they're putting out from um, now until the end of this working group, right? Like we want to continuously feed that information in so that we are making the most relevant recommendations. Um, so I definitely think because, you know, grid integration is a big term, <laughs> right? So I think we just need to hone in like what does grid integration mean to this group? Uh, and then we can pull in all of those resources. We have a lot. We have a lot to pull from, which is really great. Um, John? Sorry, very briefly. Um, I think public education is important, but there are so many organizations and industry sectors already doing it. The most important public education this group can focus on is facts on the ground. Reliable, accessible, 
affordable infrastructure that supports more vehicles every day. Those facts are going to educate the public much more significantly than a statement about the importance of EVs. Because that's what the consumer research we're doing says. When people see charging infrastructure publicly available, they know the technology is ready, and they're more inclined to consider purchase. That is the most important educational task this group can take, in my personal opinion. Thanks, John. Great. Well, thank you for the, the initial thoughts. We are going to break into our um, discussions. Um, thank you to Mike, John, and Nadia for agreeing to be the leads. So um, they will be the ones um, I've given them a sneak peek into what the questions are um, and how, how we've formatted this, this, um, this uh, session. So they will lead you through the this discussion. Um, we have the cards. Rachel, do you want to explain the cards? Sure. Uh, before we break, because we know everyone has ideas for all of the three subcommittees, and you can't be in more than uh, one place at a time, um, please take a moment to just write down your top two uh, topics that you'd like each subcommittee to address. It can just be a short statement. Um, but this way we have it and can share it with that subcommittee as they meet. So the green cards um, uh, and green, red, blue align with the um, green, medium, and heavy duty, red, um, charging networks, blue, grid integration. Please take a moment right now and then we'll collect those cards and bring them to your subcommittees as you're meeting so that you have everyone's information and ideas to work through. Uh, we are going to use the time a little condensed um, in, from our agenda, but about an hour to have you guys digest that information and start to prioritize, you know, what is it that that subcommittee wants to focus on, given what you heard from Rachel about the, the timeline of things, um, external stakeholders or, or others that you want to bring in, and ultimately what you're going to define as your goals uh, for your subcommittee to focus on to be able to bring back and present to the government. Um, so just take a moment, and when you're done, um, you can just, uh, I guess I'm going to, you can hand them over to me um, as we break out, and then we'll shuffle them and bring them to the leads that are posted here. Um, for our breakouts, if you are in the charging network uh, group, you are staying here. If you are in the medium and heavy duty group, you are going with Julie and Sarah uh, to a conference room. And then the grid integration group, is Stephen in the room? Stephen. Um, Stephen and I will bring you there, but Stephen, if you could bring them and then I'll, I'll meet you there as I shuffle the cards. Uh, so grid integration follows Stephen. Medium and heavy duty follow Julie. Charging network stays here, and when you're done with your cards, just bring them to me on your way out. All right? And we will do, so each of the leads is going to give a report out of the discussion afterwards for everyone to, to comment on and hear on the subcommittee discussion. And if I could just add, for those um, watching on Zoom, we're going to pause given our working, <coughs> our breakout sessions, um, but you'll be able to hear back, like Rachel just mentioned, the breakouts from all the discussions. Um, so we will... We will return around 1115. Okay. Thank you. Remember the date is close to the schedule as possible. Um, so thank you for the, the challenge of reading everyone's handwriting <laughs> and, and navigating dozens of note cards. Um, I hope it was helpful to at least see see what people are thinking in their heads, especially if they weren't at your table for your breakout. So right now we're going to ask um, the first of three breakouts <coughs> to report back to us. And I asked John if he could start with the charging network group. Um, we're going to ask John if you can summarize, you yep. know, especially your next steps and, and the decisions of what you prioritize. Um, Maybe in about 10, 15 minutes, and then we can... Oh, my gosh. I could do it in five. Okay. Five is perfect. <laughs> and I don't doubt that, that this group will have questions or comments right. or tie in what you all talked about in your own discussions, because just 
hearing these, these different threads, there's lots of connections as we uh, suspect. All right, so I'm going to turn okay. it over to you and then we'll go through questions. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Um, and thanks to all of you because we've got a lot of excellent perspective questions, commentary, <laughs> challenges on the cards, and we spent a good deal of our time um, looking at them and identifying themes. And so um, combining your themes with the secretary's charge or the chair's charge, um, we decided to organize uh, the discussion in terms of outcomes, public goods. And we identified um, three or four, depending on how you count them. Um, the first category, the first public good, the first set of outcomes is around accessibility and affordability. So in other words, the idea that the charging network needs to be accessible and affordable. Um, the second uh, public good we uh, defined that is very clear in the themes from the cards is the idea of reliability. Right? It has to work. It has to work all the time, every time. Um, and it's got to be interoperable between vehicles and charging. So there's a whole set of reliability public goods that we need to achieve. Um, and the, um, the third or fourth, again, depending on how you, how you count them, is that the, the charging network needs to be sustainable. And the, the sustainability idea is obviously speaks to sustainability and uh, the combination of the work we're doing with the grid group, but also sustainability from a business perspective. We heard commentary yesterday uh, about the idea that there has to be a business case for charging. And so we, when we talk about sustainability, we mean sustainability also um, from a business perspective. And so those are the public goods. Those are the big outcomes. Um, so then, as we start to as we started to get into scope, we identified uh, we 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 took the scoping and created three buckets. And the first bucket, um, in terms of the scope of the subcommittee work, is where to build charging. Right? What does dispersion look like? Um, urban and rural. Um, how does how does grid capacity support? Uh, dispersion and where to build. Um, there's an aspect of land use planning and zoning and building codes that, that plays into um, where to build. Um, there are questions, and, and this gets also to the idea of sustainability, there are questions about wealth creation, the opportunity to create um, business opportunity through the development of charging network. Um, there are uh, interstate right-of-way questions with regard to um, where to build um, as well as strategic placement post nevi right like what does the overall network look like we had a lot of conversation in the work group about the fact that there are a number of different charging network initiatives taking place there's a lot of focus on nevi in this group but there's also a tesla supercharging network that's already built out there are a series of ev se networks that are built out there is a consortium of automakers building out a network at some point we've got to figure out we have to take an inventory and understand where all of that is what the pace of that is um, and that, that i jump to a next step but we'll come back to that and then the last piece in that where to build bucket is this idea of future proofing, um, you know, and and it's incredibly complex because future proofing relates to grid capacity, future proofing relates to speed of charging, future proofing um, relates to interoperability between the the charging network and the vehicle itself, right? So there's a whole future proofing category in that bucket. Second bucket in, in scope of work is how to build. Right, so safety, security, workforce considerations. We felt like we re re needed to understand a little bit more about the workforce required and the standards of workforce <coughs> required to build out this network as quickly as um, uh, vehicle market developments require it. Um, we talked, we identified um, the need for quick and affordable grid upgrades to support this. Right, there's a sort of uh, like a uh, a, a very, very significant um, interplay between all three of these categories, obviously. And so this is like a big one. I'm sure the grid people were saying the same thing going the other way. 
Um, and so, you know, that, that there's there's clearly that that um, that synergy. <coughs> Supply chain cross cutting, obviously, the extent to which. You know, grid transformers and other, you know, like you know, e steel and all these things, you know, are are not available for grid developments. That slows down the charging network, right? So the supply chain. I mentioned permitting. This is also important in the how to build category. Um, in in terms of how to build, we had a, a a good discussion also about funding accessibility, right? To make sure that. Um, this is accessible, uh, that funding, federal funding and other funding is necessary to support um, hard to reach networks. Um, Barack made a point about tribal avail availability for, for tribal areas um, for, for funding, for example, um, and, and then interoperability in the how to build category. Um, and then the last bucket in our scope was operations. So again, to review where to build, how to build, and then now operation, right? And this again gets to interoperability, station to network, vehicle to station. Um, operation also includes pricing. Pricing transparency, how it's priced. It also includes reliability, accessibility, payment, you know, cost to charge, all of those things. So those are, that's how we, we, we um, described our scope. A note about what might be out of scope. <laughs> we had a good discussion yesterday, for example, about affordability. And one of the themes of the affordability discussion yesterday was vehicle affordability. Right? And so, you know, we think that that's something we have to keep an eye on because we think the development of the charging network and the development of robust supply chains both will encourage vehicle affordability. But we don't think that it's in scope to directly address vehicle affordability. So it's something we have to continue to keep an eye on. There's probably a metric associated with responsibility, uh, excuse me, affordability um, that we can look at. But we didn't really sort of specifically reach that in terms of these are the incentives that are required or this is the right, you know, sort of, sort of price for a vehicle. Okay, next steps. Um, we need metrics. Like, I, I loved what Rachel said at the beginning uh, of the meeting today. I loved what both secretaries and especially Secretary Granholm said about the idea that we have to have metrics. We couldn't agree more. We have to define them. Like, what are the metrics that define those public goods, affordability, accessibility, reliability, and sustainability? Um, so we, we as, a, as a subcommittee, want to start to look at the research and then further get your feedback and other feedback about how, what are those definitions. Um, we need to do baselining, next steps baselining um, of, as I mentioned earlier, sort of take an inventory on what dispersion looks like, where is it today and where is it going so we can identify gaps. We're trying to figure out what the government's <laughs> role and responsibility is in that vis-a-vis uh, -vis the public sector. but. There is a see the whole chessboard aspect of dispersion that I don't think we've grappled with yet. Um, second um, or third, um, you know, we need to look at the work already being done by the Joint Office on minimum standards, and we need to figure out how they get communicated to the public. There are two aspects of these minimum standards. One is what they require of the developer of the charging network. But there's also an aspect of the minimum standards, what they communicate to the public. Like, when I'm driving down the road, I want to know that the station my app shows me is working. And I want to know that it's safe and that it's well lit and that it takes any payment that I'm <coughs> in my wallet. And so, you know, we've defined as a next step thinking about how that works from the consumer's aspect, not just... Um, the developer of the networks aspect. Um, we think there's some workforce baselining that we need to do, um, some status baselining. Um, some of us who are on the industrial side of the EV transformation are aware of a project already taking place with the Department of Energy and the Department of Labor on workforce standards related to the development of the EV industrial base. What does, you know, what is required of the workforce for battery plants and other components and those types of things. We think there's probably a similar exercise that probably needs to take place. We've got to get Kevin's input and others about what, what role, if any, 
there is for some baselining in the workforce space. Uh, and then lastly, baselining with regard to public planning. You know, what, where are building codes required? It seems like the definition of insanity that we're allowing buildings to be built today, whether they're commercial or residential, that are not charging ready. Like, are, are we kidding? Um, so those types of things, business codes, zoning, permitting, and other public planning aspects, we need to do a, some baselining there. Uh, and understand where it's working, where it's not, and then from there define what the appropriate local, as primarily and maybe state uh, requirements are. Um, so that's a quick review. Let me ask my colleagues in the subcommittee whether there's anything um, that I missed or should be um, uh, addressed before we open it up to the group. I think you did a fantastic okay. job, John. Okay, all good. I think it's a good summary, and uh, I thank you very much for shepherding us through the process and staying <laughs> away from the AM radio issue. <laughs> yes, no, we're not. That's not in scope. <laughs> it's in scope somewhere else, but not this group. Not today. Great, thank you. Um, for the other groups that met, are there any particular connections you want to highlight? Um, you know. We'll get into details of your breakouts after lunch, but anything you want to share that really resonated with what you heard from this group? Yes. Just real quick, Bethany Jones out of the DOE is the one handling the workforce development oh, that's activity. Right. Bethany. Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned um, the quick affordable grid, grid updates, uh, upgrades, and I would say that definitely aligns with the I had a couple of things uh, that I wanted to reflect on. Um, I, I really like how you laid this out. I like that you numbered things and like are, we're really trying to organize our thoughts here. Um, a few things that I think are important to keep in perspective is when to make decisions, when to take action, mm -hmm. because this is an evolving network. We're never going to have perfect information, especially as we're building out even just the, yeah. you know, the charging network itself. So like, what information does this group feel is good enough to start making more investments or other types of decisions? Um, and specifically on the minimum standards, I just want to point out that in, in the title itself, they are minimum standards, <laughs> right? They're absolutely bare minimum that we, as we develop it, think are required to have the foundation of an interoperable, convenient, reliable, and equitable charging network. I would love if this EV working group focused on what else is needed. Yes. What else can we actually add on to those minimum standards to ensure that the customer is driving up to a station in Ohio and Nevada and having the exact same experience. Yeah. I know um, NASIO and the states are also working on this, but it's, it's patchwork right now. We're all doing this in parallel, um, and it's definitely what the Joint Office is here to help with. Um, but I think an industry perspective, especially since you guys can bring in some of the consumer perspective in a, in a way that the government doesn't have access to, um, is it, that would be incredible. I think that would be, that could really move the needle on like, not only what are the minimum standards, but then what, what does industry think is required in order for this business model as an EV ecosystem to be successful? I, I love that. And I just one, um, and I don't think I mentioned it sufficiently to uh, represent the group's discussion. One of the things that came out in, in, along those lines specifically is the fact that the minimum standards, or even something beyond minimum standards, aren't transparent to the customer. They have no idea. Right, and so you know, there's the idea of almost like a real time, like an application, like a real time indication of what you're, like a good housekeeping seal, seal of approval, a thumbs up, some sort of digital, you know, sort of representation of what that is that the customer gets, um, in addition to what the, you know, the developers of the network are expected to do. Is there anything anyone put on their index card that? You would that you didn't feel was incorporated 
you know, given the priorities um, identified that you want to bring to the table or ask, you know, why not? Because um, there were lots of ideas on the cards, and I think a lot of them did lend themselves to similar themes. But anything that you felt like was missing or you want to inquire about? You did a stellar job. Oh, I just, I, oh I'm sorry. But before Nadia, uh, before Nadia mentions, I, I, the cyber discussion, I didn't. I don't think I referenced it, but we we did talk about cyber and data access in the context of both how to build as well as operation and reliability. So, like there was a lot of um, talk about that. I do think it's it's sort of baked into to that aspect of it. I'm sorry. I would. I would. I would. Say that I would imagine that would be a part of what Rachel just mentioned. Yes. What else is needed beyond okay. those minimum standards? That's how I would view it. Got it. Personally. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I think there are because there are existing standards for cyber, and I would argue, not getting into it, that they're not sufficient. There could be more done. So, like, what are those areas? And, and just to be clear, we expanded security to be not just cyber, but safety and security yeah. overall. Yeah. Physical. So I, I think it's implicit there, but just thinking, and we'll talk about it on the grid one, but um, information early and often, and I think we've done a great job working with the states for NAVI on where sites are going to be located to understand capacity and needed upgrades, et cetera. So information to your local utility before you even think you should be talking to them. Talking to them. So like some guidance potentially around that. That's great. All right. I do have one question. I didn't put it on the card, but that just brought it up, which is when you, when you guys talked about the siting of stations, was there consideration given, you know, to ancillary services? Because, for example, um, I'm a mother, my kids are older, but a barrier for perhaps a mother or a parent with small children could be stations that do not have, where you can't buy water, where you can't go to the bathroom, again, safety, you know, personal safety. Um, I think that's a real, you know, that doesn't have good lighting. I think those are real, um, those are those are metrics that the consumer is going to make decisions based on. So I think they're really important, and I Great. think they need to be considered in the siting. Yeah, I would also Great. add, we've gotten feedback on um, locations that uh, can discriminate against race as well. Um, neighborhoods that are unsafe mm -hmm. for people to go to, yep. um, particularly feeling comfortable in, in that neighborhood, um, and, and just making sure that everyone, you know, that it's well lit, that I think there's also the, the um, uh, you know, we, we're designing these for, for able-bodied people too, and so making sure that we're taking into consideration various uh, levels of disability and being able to access. So I, I assume that's in the accessibility component yes. of it, especially mm -hmm. if I know Kelsey well. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I think there's a handful of components of that, how, how consumers are making decisions based on gender, race, ability, et cetera. Yeah, it's great comments. Yeah, not only that, we had equity as a cross-cutting piece. So it's in all the buckets, accessibility, reliability, and sustainability, and so, uh, gender equity, inclusion, disability rights, etc., is part of that. Mark, did you just building on Laura's and, and Rachel's point on, on cyber, uh, that you know, we we uh, on the federal side are, are struggling with this uh, mightily, trying to set standards. I know working with you guys when you're first doing it, it is a minimum standard. Uh, how how do how are we thinking about how we're going to build that out? Like, is it is it Industry standard is it? You know, are we getting this involved? You know, in other words, like that—that that is a multi-determinative process that does not feel easy. Yeah. So I do think that there is a lot of work. It's very similar. Like we're running in parallel. We're trying to solve a lot of different solutions all at the same time. Um, Joint office is working actually very closely with. Um, uh, other agencies on cyber, including the White House. Cyber, uh, White House has very specific um, cyber uh, um, mandate, and they are, so I think maybe what I can take as a note is like, let's get some updates on that. Yeah. Um, let's, let's figure out kind of the ecosystem of where people are working on cyber, 
um, because it does break down silos. You know, DOE alone has Caesar, our cyber uh, uh, office, but then we also now have the joint office that's focused on EV charging as it relates to cyber. Um, we've got the White House initiative. Um, you have NIST, so there's a lot of different components here. So I think DOD. we can do DOD. yeah. DOD, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and just one, just just to finish that. I mean, there are also uh, NHTSA has cyber policies and requirements for the vehicle, yep. <laughs> and so you know the vehicle's already you know um, hardened against cy potential cyber uh, intrusions at, at any threat vector. One of which is the charging port. So, like, I think you have to. Make sure that's integrated as well. I, I would also, I, I would just add that uh, I'm also on that uh, White House group, and so I, they're focused a lot on uh, generation and production of energy, uh, as opposed to uh, and EV uh, charging is a uh, one of their areas that they're looking at, but but they're, they're really it's a much broader perspective. So if we can if we can get specific on chargers, that would be helpful. All right. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. Like in terms of timing, how did like you know we, we struggled with this a little bit in the grid side. You know we've got a report in twenty twenty five, and and you know we shouldn't wait to twenty twenty five for yeah. cyber. I, yeah. how, should <laughs> I agree. Start, how should we start thinking? About I, I would say let's get all the ideas out on the table first and then we can start thinking about prioritizing. I think there are probably some ideas that lend themselves to quicker turnarounds. Um, you know, actually Rachel and I were consulting about who we wanted to go first and we thought charging network should go first just because it's here, right? Like we are actually doing it. So there's probably a, a kind of immediate urgency to the charging network, whereas maybe the grid integration, because um, it does take a long time to um, implement some of these solutions while we should be acting now and thinking about it now, uh, you know, maybe that's right for a kind of a later report or activity. So I think we want to maybe get everything out on the table first and then figure out how this stacks up in, in our urgency. and and. I think reasonable actions too. Like, what what can we do right now? Um, not just how urgent is it? It just our, our final report out. I should have mentioned this earlier. My comment, rather, is that you know you, you have a question. Does the subcommittee want to meet before the next EV working group? And we've answered yes. Like, and I think it's for that reason. I think we we felt there's more prioritization that we need to do, given that we're up and running already. So, yeah. so we are going to take that on to, to to meet again soon to try and sort of further prioritize. Yeah, and I think too, thinking about how we start pulling other people in, other resources, um, we can be very helpful okay. in making those connections, giving you guys, um, you know, the, the people and the reports and publications. I mean, obviously all of you have access to your networks as well, but, um, you know, we're, we're happy to support that if you guys are like, hey, I. I want to get the download on on this thing because okay. we've identified it as an early priority. We're happy to help with that. So I think I'll use this time to bring us into our lunch break, but tell you a little bit about the afternoon. So like with this report out, and thank you very much for it, um, we'll hear from the other two groups with similar discussion, um, and then we'll hear from the public. So the idea is between these discussions, the public comments, then you'll have as much information as possible for today that will give you a half hour to regroup as a subcommittee just to you know, bring it all together and just identify those actions. If it's scheduling a meeting, if it's wanting to talk to the other subcommittee and coordinate on something, or another comment sparked a question, we just want to give you a little time while it's still fresh. Um, and so that'll be the remainder of our afternoon where you're, you're hearing from the groups and the public and being able to discuss them. And then you'll come back at the very end with just five minutes for each uh, subcommittee to tell us exactly, like, what's your next step. Um, did you have a question? I do have a general question for later, which is, I think for me at least, it would be really helpful to get some guidance on what actually needs to be completed by the next meeting, because um, what needs to be completed and in what format? Is it continued ideation? Is it some, like, because 
there's not a lot of time. We've got the holidays. There's multiple, pre you know, so how, how to, helping You're us all figure. volunteering your time. You have day jobs. Yeah, so totally. that would be super helpful to get a little bit of a sense of what is actually expected so that we can then do our best. Yeah, let's um, spend some time on that maybe after the other two report outs. Um, I, I want to help you guys um, really set the, like, let's, let's get ready for success, right? Let's not bite off more than we can chew at first. Let's not think, you know, we're going to write a 20-page cybersecurity brief before, <laughs> before we get to the next meeting. Let's maybe just tackle some, some early initial uh, steps that are, are important to us and um, ramp up in a way that we feel comfortable. Um, taking into consideration holidays, day jobs, etc. So um, I would say let's drive to the, that last um, session of like very clearly articulating what are the next steps, probably like three next steps per subcommittee and having a lead person, like who's going to be responsible, who's going to send the email, who's going to schedule the meeting. Um, and then maybe we even have a report out type of time in the next meeting um, where we can reflect on that. Um, but yeah, and, and I think one of the most important things since we, we're meeting every 120 days, right? That's pretty frequent um, for a volunteer organization, more or less. So um, like, what do you guys need, right? Like put us on alert to in the next meeting get you, you know, cyber. If we if we think cybersecurity is a priority, we will line up cybersecurity presentations for you. If you think, um, you know, grid integration uh, is, you know, you want utilities to come and speak, like let's let's line that up. Um, I also think that a lot of those conversations can happen at a more detailed level at the subcommittee. So just figuring out like, what do we need the whole group for? And then what can the subcommittees feel empowered to do in between meetings? But yeah, I think, I think our, our uh, it even says th three to five actions. So I think that's what we're driving towards. Is a subcommittee, three to five actions, who's doing those? Um, and maybe even if, if it's a priority, like backups of who's doing those so that if, you know, someone gets sick or someone has a holiday that they weren't able to get it done before or something like that, they're able to pass it along. Okay, so I believe everyone received information on lunch. Um, is there anything else I need to announce on lunch? I think we're good. We do have printouts of the list that was emailed in the back. If you need it, you can see Kim. Um, and then we'll escort you out um, if you are assuming everyone's going outside for lunch. Uh, we will resume sharply at 1.15, so please give yourselves time to go back through security um, like we did yesterday at probably, I don't know, 12.45, uh, 1 o'clock arrival, and we'll start back at 1.15. Hearing which group do we say we're uh, the grid yep. grid integration will be next. Okay. Stuff here? You can leave your belongings here. Is the cafeteria open? Uh, no, no longer. Oh, uh, no longer viable <laughs> option. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. uh, well, no yeah. That is your only choice. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. We'll be happy to escort you out. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I think we are jumping back into report outs, and the next one we were going to do was grid integration. Um, so we'll have Nadia give uh, a summary of the group discussion. Um, are there any questions, anything we need to address before we launch into report outs? Awesome. Thank you so much. Nadia, all right. What's yours? Well, thank you for the comments. A lot of great feedback. Uh, to summarize, we took them and tried to bucket them into some high-level categories. You'll, you'll see some themes emerging here, but our eight categories were supply chain, speed, regulatory, affordability, education, slash business models. I might argue if they should be together, but we put them together. Um, grid readiness, partnerships, and then clean, slash carbon-free, can kind of apply to a different, uh, several different components. So 
uh, we thought about those areas and then tried to think, uh, classify them as kind of a what and a how. And so we attempted to prioritize and create four focus areas. So we kind of, um, Rachel stole the, the, the concept that you have, the pyramid and the cross-cutting components. So our four focus areas are grid readiness, comprehensive planning, transparency slash education slash roadmap, uh, and then finally partnerships because we think that's going to be absolutely essential uh, for grid readiness. And then uh, some of the other themes we thought truly were cross-cutting. So we have our original cross-cutting components, which are equity, of course, um, the workforce focus, and metrics. So we are uh, sticking with those, but we added uh, three others, affordability, speed, we turn speed into cross-cutting because we think that impacts you know, our four key areas, and data. So um, again, our four focus areas, grid readiness, comprehensive planning, transparency slash education slash roadmap, and then four partnership, and then cross-cutting are our original three plus affordability, speed, and data. So any questions? Well, maybe I'm just supposed to report out first before. Should I just keep going? Okay. So as far as, uh, and we'll dive into a little, a few examples of these here in a minute, but as far as uh, next steps, we really were focused on the baselining. I'll borrow your term. We call it slightly different, but the same thing, basically understanding uh, what's out there. Specifically, we talked a lot about tools, uh, inventories, so tools that you know have been created by um, the federal government, private sector, NGOs, you know, how do we even have a, a landscape view of the tools to help us understand the baseline settings? And then um, from there, a gap analysis, so understanding what are the gaps, what, what's missing, what do we need? And then that will drive our metric, the third step is our establishment of metrics. Um, we did talk about uh, a, a lot of, um, we talked about some examples. So we'll give you uh, a couple of concepts that we discussed. So under grid readiness, you know, that's everything from supply chain, you know, thinking about transformers, how do we get that? That's a great concrete example. We all know um, after the pandemic, we saw a 400% increase in lead time for transformers uh, in the industry. Um, that's an area we actually think that pretty quickly, and we know there are ongoing discussions. We could see the federal government um, helping uh, on that front. But permitting, you talked about permitting, um, technology, no regrets investments, things of that nature. You know, how do we how do we really think about that? The comprehensive planning, again, that has, you know, you can approach it from a variety of perspectives, but um, Thinking about rural versus urban needs, medium heavy duty versus light duty vehicles, you know, a lot of the topics we've discussed. We also, from a grid planning perspective, have to think about not just electrification of transportation, but electrification of buildings, uh, natural load growth that will come through uh, data centers and economic development. And <coughs> typically, you have to look at the whole picture and not just plan for one piece. So, thinking, always keeping in mind, how do we think about this critically important EV piece, but it's part of an umbrella of an energy, once in a lifetime energy transition. And um, transparency, there was a lot of discussion about, um, somebody put in their comments, the utility suit of programs, incentives, even understanding rates. Uh, so really helping to understand the utility soup. I kind of like that. We thought it was a beefy stew. <laughs> Delicious beefy stew, um, but so we, so that was and we, and we talked about um, understanding, you know, what's available, just some basic road mapping education, and then partnership. We kept that separate, but that truly is, you know, there's a tremendous opportunity, quite frankly, for all, all of these entities to partner together, and we've been doing it in many different ways, but I think there's a lot more. And so that feeds into understanding like the business models of um, a specific industry and the utilities. You know, how, how do they function? How do they work? How can you align there? And uh, finally, I'll just note, we, we spent a lot of time starting to talk about what are the short-term things we need to do versus longer, you know, mid and longer term. 
we would look to probably make some recommendations before. I mean, we all felt like 2025 was a long way out and the sense of urgency to move on certain components we think is probably greater. So having some potential um, activities beforehand is something that we're, uh, we talked about. We definitely are gonna meet again. Um, and let's see, a couple of items, and we'll reframe this, but this would just base with our final next, you know, kind of next steps. But we definitely wanna in meet, we'd like to have an inventory hopefully by January of at least the federal programs, but we talked about, you know, EPRI, EEI, other organizations, nonprofits are doing a lot of work. How do we leverage that versus reinventing the wheel? Um, we did spend some time talking about some potential short-term immediate steps vis-a-vis -vis supply chain that could be very helpful. And um, we'll talk further about some no regrets and other things when we reconvene. So. I think at a very high level, what did I, team, what did I miss? Rid readiness, here we come. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. That's So that's our summary. Awesome. Great. Let's open it up for a discussion. Um, thank you for, that's a comprehensive report out. A um, question I have is one of the things um, that kind of aligns from, from our group, the medium heavy duty group to your group is, does the grid readiness or even the comprehensive planning angle, does either of them address the, what I describe as sort of the misaligned timelines and incentives between some of these transportation sector investments and some of the, you know, utility sector investments and regulations, in other words, you know, the need for larger power sources within a given time frame and how those two things aren't necessarily matching up. Um, I think that's really critical, and so I just wonder if that was part of one of those um, four priorities. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the speed, so that cross-cutting, I think, touches on speed, um, thinking about reliability, but absolutely, and uh, we did discuss that, that we have to... Right now we are seeing situations where there is not alignment and then also taking a step further, what, what do you do? So what are the temporary solutions, right? And how do we work to facilitate um, this, this, you know, some solutions um, as, as the grid is being built out? So it's not no, um, see you, you know, down the road. It's okay, what else might we be able to do? Uh, but I think that goes back to some of the education in that many industries have not had to deal with the utilities in the way we're seeing. And so they don't, you know, there's kind of an assumption, I can just plug it in, right? Or I can just get the infrastructure there. But just like you're going through with siting of charging, I mean, that siting for distribution of feeder upgrades, the construction, the labor, the materials, the supply chain, all of that is, I'd say charging is a microcosm of, think about the entire grid and substations and what that's triggering and the timelines there. So, you know, there are a lot of great efforts to coordinate better there, but I think we also need to think about some interim solutions. Rachel, I feel like I accidentally started to facilitate for you, so I'm passing it back to you. <laughs> Sorry, great name. Just got excited. Like. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Uh, Rakesh, I see you. Here yeah, so a couple of comments, uh, which potentially intersect the great integration and the medium and heavy duty vehicles, but even otherwise. And one of them is just piggybacking on your last <coughs> part on the timeline or the speed, right? So in our group, we also talked about um, the opportunity for some paradigm shift and how we do the business today in terms of customers coming to with an or firm order, this is the requirement for a particular site, and if we stack up all those processes and the stakeholders involved, it tends to be a multi-year timeline, multiple stakeholders involved, and it's a very serial process. So which ones of those can be done in parallel, where we're maybe anticipating demand <coughs> of future electric vehicles? I'm talking from a medium-heavy perspective, but applies to light duty as well, and are able to set some of those things in motion already. 
And it's tricky because today it's dependent on the responsibility to the rate payers and who's going to bear the cost of that investment. So how do we solve that element of it and are able to proactively do that investment in anticipation of demand? Oh, that's a great point. And I think the no regrets investment, um, certainly we've been working, I know you all are working with every EVs to right. scale, yep. as are many utilities, and there's a lot of great work there to understand um, where where we are seeing concentrations of medium and heavy duty fleets now and, and how we anticipate that will evolve in the future, which gives some certainty and you can line that up with capacity and needs and what we think um, with the industry, I think it, there's great opportunity to do no regrets investments. Exactly. A lot um, of our vehicles are connected today. We can use that data to anticipate or predict well times, durations, and things like that, and identify those hubs, which would be part of the no regret investment. One other item we talked about is standardization. So, you know, we, there's that can cut across many different um, you know, angles and, and, and avenues, but um, standardization also, I think, with some of the site design opportunities, and we were talking a little bit about this at lunch, kind of bucketizing. So how, you know, Yes, each site is unique, but there are some things that we can see. How can we replicate that? And even on the utility side, some of the things we've been doing is understanding for, for example, for make ready work at a commercial site, what are components we know we're always going to need to have for certain sites and how can we maybe pre-order and have some inventory in stock to be ready? So I think also from, um, from the industry side, you know, there may be an opportunity to think about kind of some different um, standards that we could apply or sizing. And maybe a second comment is related to uh, potentially a very specific need for medium and heavy vehicles as we anticipate a future development and faster rates of charging, so megawatt charging standards. And now you imagine uh, 50 type of trucks at a truck stop or a single location trying to draw these heavy loads. You're easily talking double digit megawatt type numbers, 2025, for example. Mike in his presentation called them I know, the larger loads beyond the 10 megawatts, let's say. And that would be a unique requirement on the medium and heavy side. And, you know, certainly from a grid integration or grid readiness perspective, a very specific uh, intersection of our uh, subcommittees here. Absolutely. John? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, there's a theme here. I think I, I agree with everything that's been said. I, um, and it does apply, I think, to the light duty sector. The one thing I just would want to add is that I think there's an opportunity for us to identify a set of metrics that unify all of the work groups. And I'm, you know, again, reflecting on, uh, you know, the JD Power presentation from yesterday and the idea that, that the light duty EV market's growing at two and a half to three times the charging, public charging uh, network. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of work in the industry, the auto industry sector with Nehruk, for example, and others. I think there are probably two or three, it isn't 10 and it isn't one, it's two or three or four at most metrics that we can identify. And if we're measuring them, we're focusing on them. And if we're focusing on them, then we're looking for solutions. So I would, I would hope we would be able to identify what those, what those key, you know, KPIs or key metrics are that indicate the particular gap, you know, the, the gap that Laura mentioned, the gap between the aspiration and the reality. Does anyone else have anything that made it to your index card but you didn't hear mentioned yet? Any things you feel are missing or you'd like to uh, ask, ask about? I have one. Um, <coughs> I didn't put it on the index card, but just curious if was vehicle to grid technology solutions putting power back in the grid was that discussed because I think yeah. that's a longer term item yeah we didn't we didn't discuss that expressly but I think the comprehensive planning really looks at how do we think about that holistic planning so generation side so we have to make sure that we're going to be able to produce the carbon free energy that's reliable uh, transmission the high powered lines right the, the plug plug in and then the distribution system um, I think that planning has historically been at the utility level and like in resource planning distribution system plans that are filed with the commissions or the city council they're public and then there's the customer 
cited or distributed energy resources and how do those work together. We've already started some of those areas like managed charging and things like that, but that's certainly um, something that down the road, I think, and there's a lot of pi there are pilots actually um, and work like different utilities are working with the auto OEMs and others on um, vehicle to, to X pilots right now. So yeah, it's definitely... I would only add that, yeah, I think it actually unites all three groups in a way because, you know, school buses are a great use case and there's pilots going on with school buses. Obviously, if, if that's something that's going to become, I'm going to say, more standardized, right, in the light duty sector, that's something that the autos would need to be incorporating eventually. Um, so it would, you'd need all three groups working together on something like that for the longer term. Yeah, it's... It, we didn't dive into all the details. We, I think we were thinking that's more longer term. It's like there's the immediate kind of pieces, but absolutely. Just to amplify what she was saying, and you mentioned the DERs, I think it's important to consider the requirements for battery backup systems, microgrids, solar, local power, what may be required, especially in California. So yeah, I heard you mention it. I was just going to say that's what so, you know, on-site storage, you know, on-site generation, we, talk about um, we talked about that stuff because we thought it was all kind of the same bucket, you know, it, it, so, uh, on, on the, yeah, on the charging side, like, you know, Tesla's coming out with a bi-directional charger that, that you can put in your home. So, you know, how you handle all that, I think, falls into the same technology issues and the same grid stuff that Other comments or questions for the grid integration group? Rachel, do you have anything? Um, could I ask you to read that first list one more time? Sure. Of our four, of, of the four focus areas? Yeah. Okay. Grid readiness. Yep. Which is kind of our name. We've <laughs> 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 talked about that a little bit. Comprehensive planning. This was kind of the weird one, but transparency slash education slash roadmap. We couldn't align on one term there. And then four, partnership. Yep. Great. Anything else from anyone for this topic? Okay. Well, thank you very much. All right. Mike. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, medium and heavy trucks. Um, I should say medium and heavy duty because the first thing we did was like take a step backward and we said why do we need uh, a separate group for medium and heavy duty I mean what's different about medium and heavy duty and I'm glad we did that because it forced us to think about light duty these are the heavy duty medium duty and so forth and so um, the rest of what I'm going to say kind of builds on some of what we talked about when we talked about what makes this part of the EV transition unique um, so then we, we actually did make a decision right away on that this, the focus of this would be classes six to eight. So medium duty, quote unquote, sometimes refers to all the way down to class three, sometimes six, seven. I mean, there's a lot of confusion there. So I would bring up, <clears throat> and so we, we said it was six to eight, all medium duty and heavy duty, which does include transit buses and, and um, you know freight movement which I talked about yesterday but might also include we're not sure yet you know more vocational types of trucks um, you know those that are you know maybe even garbage trucks snow plow dump trucks etc 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 so a little bit of a question there but definitely we decided the work would be six to eight um, so for class three to five we, we do want it to be part of this overall effort and not forgotten. So, um, you know, the UPS, USPS truck, the, the uh, delivery vans and step vans and other sort of class three to five are actually a bigger player than they were 10 years ago with uh, e-commerce and some other things. So um, with respect to the index cards, with all due respect, we didn't even look at them. <laughs> we got busy and we said we will uh, uh, assess all of those next steps so that we can kind of look at how that maps all this. So, then we got into um, what would be in scope for this subcommittee and what would be out of scope for the subcommittee. Um, and so it was a real brainstorming effort around um, what's in scope, uh, a lot of discussion around standardization. Uh, you know, we had a nice mix of 
some of us who've spent our careers in heavy trucking and, and some others on the subcommittee that uh, didn't have quite that experience. So it was really good to talk about standardization. Um, we talked about whether that's software and APIs, or whether that's vehicle specifications, charging networks, and so forth. One example, uh, you know, that comes to mind is charging port locations. And these trucks can be 50 feet long, right? So where is the charge port, and how do you do interoperability when one can be 50 feet or 100 feet, of, you know, if you're going around corners of the vehicle and so forth? Uh, we talked about early high volume market segments that are that are happening quicker than others. Um, uh, we talked about uh, regulatory considerations. What Rakesh just brought up about um, some of these actual depots or addresses or truck stops are going to be are going to need significant amount of power with uh, very fast charging um, pieces. Now we will we'll do what we need to do around. Um, indexing and, and sequencing and, and you know trying to make it all not hit at one time but the fact matters is this is a lot of power because we're moving a lot of, a lot of weight um, and we talked about what, what we wrote down as misalignment and in government incentives for utilities and infrastructure and the uh, vehicles themselves so sort of this idea that the vehicles are coming and you know even to the point around passenger cars um, we had a, one more question about in scope. I don't think we really answered what is in scope or out of scope is the whole idea of uh, it's kind of workforce development and consumer, um, uh, the consumer sort of thing. So with respect to drivers and mechanics and so forth, we kind of see the alignment of TCO and total cost of ownership and business to business decisions here as helpful in the EV transition. And um, you know they, they these trucks are tools, and so uh, we, that's kind of we're not sure how much we need to do there versus maybe what we need to do in the public sector with cars. Um, out of scope, um, we said that there are, well the class three to five, uh, and then we also said there are some hard segments of trucking that we ought to just not worry about. <laughs> you know. Um, I always use the example logging trucks in Saskatchewan. I mean, you know, good for them, but do we need to get them to zero emission in the next 30 years? I'm not so sure. So think about um, what maybe we don't focus on rather than the big impact areas. And then another out of scope, uh, which is kind of interesting, is it was brought up is around bridge fuels. So things like renewable fuels, renewable natural gas. Uh, we had a quick spirited discussion that I'm sure will bleed into the next few months around hydrogen burning hydrogen in an engine and how it fits in a helpful transition or a hurtful <laughs> problem or, or whatever um, so that that though we said we were going to study it a little bit but it was likely out of scope so then we we uh, as we were trying to boil all this into what do we do now so um, we did get into some really healthy discussions around the next steps so one was uh, defining priorities for us as a subcommittee. Start to sequencing activities. I mean, what are the truckings at a different place than cars? Um, cars are at nine percent. Trucks at half of one percent, or some like ridiculously small number. So we're at a different place and later. And so that helps us in some ways, and, and maybe hurts us in other ways. But we felt like there were some definite things that needed to be done now. To get that adoption up and some of the things that to be done later um, see if the other team members agree with me on that summary but uh, so we really want to spend some time over the next couple of months working on priorities which includes how we look at total cost of ownership and then two other things that uh, actions will be taking is really getting into how we define requirements of electric electrification better <coughs> so two areas one is vehicle specs and standardization so what are the vehicle specs that um, are likely, knowing that trucks are different all over, but what are sort of the common things? And, and, the, and then the electric demands um, from a charging standpoint. So how much and where, we talked about that just a few minutes ago. And then lastly, um, for a couple of things that we currently have in scope, we think it's important <coughs> for us as a subcommittee to make some statements around. So over the next couple of months, make us some statements around Hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles um, being, we suggest it definitely for trucking needs to be in scope of this EV working group. 
But what does that really mean? Some statements around that. Some statements around regulatory um, considerations or facts or realities. Um, and then finally, these, uh, these what we're currently calling bridges, <coughs> like, like, like paragraphs or like a position almost on, on those three in the short term as part of the scope. So that was, yeah, that was, that was pretty much it. <coughs> we do promise to read all the index cards from all of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anybody that was in the room, anything I, I missed or was too light on or we should make, <coughs> should we talk about? Good job, no? good summary, thank you. So maybe we have a preview of the index cards. Is there no way? Yeah, Julie looked at them. No one in this group will review them. Is there anything um, anyone has strong feelings about that they put on their index card and you would want this group to know about today, given what we heard? Kelsey, and then Crystal, and Danielle. Yeah, just from your presentation yesterday when you were talking about uh, fleets kind of reorganizing how they work to allow electrification to take place. Um, some best practices or ideas or any assistance that could be provided to industry on that. Good suggestion. Mm -hmm. Operational changes. Mm -hmm. Crystal, you are next. Yeah, I did not give you an index card, but, uh, but we have been uh, talking to some hydrogen fuel distributors. Um, and it sounds like they are building out distribution and uh, ways to, like that whole corridor between like Seattle, Canada is pretty much all built out at this point. Um, so I know they have trucks um, up there. So I don't know, like, to, to, to signal to that industry that they're out of scope. Uh, I mean, I know we're called the electric vehicle working group. Um, <coughs> Well, we're suggesting it's in. Yeah. To, to we're definitely it's saying it's in. Yeah. Okay. But we just want to, we, we think it's valuable to say why we think it's in. Okay. Okay. I, miss, I misheard you the other day, so that was completely And the distinction between hydrogen ice versus hydrogen, hydrogen fuel cells. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm talking about the uh, fuel, fuel cells. Fuel cells. Yeah. And even not fuel cells. Oh. Yeah. So, so, um, so like there, there's liquid hydrogen distribution stations that they're building out along that corridor. Yes, um, the, you know, liquid hydrogen can be used in a fuel cell or in an engine. So I think the um, the, the question is, uh, you know, of course the whole industry, government, and others are working on the pros and cons of, of uh, hydrogen in an engine, burning in an engine. A pro is you can get the infrastructure going while the fuel cells are being developed and so forth um, uh, and so forth. But we felt like this was an electric vehicle working group and it should be based on battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell electric um, for the purposes of, the, of this group. But um, we're open to feedback, I mean, of course. Maybe yeah, there's just a nod to the industry. Recognize if I can just chime in with one comment. So fuel cell vehicles can be considered electric vehicles because the drivetrain is electric. So from that perspective, even from a nomenclature or semantics, it fits with an EV working group, right? If you want it to fit, it's an easier fit in. Combustion engine typically would not fit into this scope, but some of us would argue it's potentially a, a good complementary technology, at least as a bridging technology in decarbonization. Overall, for hydrogen, we felt um, we should have a position paper or position statement, as Mike was alluding to. But maybe the timeline can be different because we cannot take everything on at the same time, right? So there are near-term priorities, and then potentially hydrogen is a second step, uh, which can come later. I absolutely agree with that, yeah. Danielle? Sure, thanks. Um, one of the cards you will find <laughs> uh, talks about data sharing. 
and uh, the importance of, or information sharing, right? Coming from the grid integration side, we think of everything as data. But information sharing uh, to support that medium heavy duty and grid integration piece. And I think that's um, a part that came up in our working group as well. And so I'm not sure that I heard it in what you were talking about yet. It may be part of the solution set as opposed to part of the Laid out, but um, wanted to make a no. I think it's an excellent point. I mean, these these trucks are now data factories, and like everything else in life, right? I mean, they, they are, um, uh, you know, the uh, these trucks are are these trucks have had to be. I mean, I don't want to get into too much history, but you know, we had uh, Caterpillar, Cummins, and Detroit engines in all six truck brands for like forty years. So the how how different. Um, you know, components work together in a truck and how that, um, you know, as we've gone to electronics and electrification software and so forth and all these, uh, you know, CPUs on the vehicles and so forth, I think they have become incredibly data, you know, they're just, you know, they're no different than cars, maybe even more so. And so um, it is easy sometimes to forget letting the data lead the way. So I hear, absolutely, yeah, I think we hear you really well. And we did talk about the need for that digital handshake, and that's where we talked about whether there's data standards, APIs, those types of systems to allow for sharing of information, um, which ties into that. And there's both the, the data data, and then the customer information sharing yeah. part, right? And the previews, you know, as the point Nadia was making, the previews to the utilities that, yeah. somewhere between one to five years from now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> preferably five. Uh, you know, we anticipate that we're going to need 25 megawatts in uh, and around this location kind of stuff. So just the planning differently. Ah, uh, okay. Um, the proactive, the you know, we're talking about this comprehensive planning, data. but totally. the proactive planning, yeah. Planning, okay. data sharing that supports planning. Thank you. Yes. Data sharing that supports yeah. planning. And this will be phased, right? I mean, uh, you know, it's one thing to know what a site might ultimately need for 100% of their <laughs> trucks versus where they're at in the next early phases. John, Nadia, Rachel, Mark. Yeah, just, just to finish that conversation, I think that I 100% agree that came up in our discussion as well at the uh, on the light duty side, right? Sort of that, sort of where, where you know, the planning aspect of it. And obviously, you're such big users of power on a per unit basis relative to the light duty that you're going to be leading the charge in a lot of ways, no pun intended. So we have to sort of figure that out. The work that we're all doing together, I think, in EV2 scale is a really good sort of body of work that's developing that can be brought into this conversation, maybe? That would make sense? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So, so I want to switch gears really quickly. You mentioned a statement around regulatory, I think you said. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of regulatory dynamics that are floating in this space, right? At the light, light duty, heavy duty, you know, vehicle side, you know, sort of uh, utility side. What is it that you're, you would suggest the working group articulate in the standards, in the, excuse me, in the regulatory space? Well, it was off, the, the discussion was it was offered quickly by one of us that it should be out of scope. And then it was like, no, we can't. I'm not in scope, so we just had this whole debate around it, and we just chose to to uh, work on what that might uh, look like. Whether that's like, uh, I don't know what that. You know, we we didn't get around any any more than that. Uh, I think that it's an important tension, right? I mean, because I, I do think that it is a certainly on the vehicle side, it's a driver, right? Of of adoption, and so it's something I think we have to be cognizant of from a grid readiness perspective and from a, uh, a charging network perspective. So if, if that's the sense of it, right, which I is so. we have to understand the extent to which market readiness is driven by industry investment and to the extent that market readiness might also be driven by regulation, that we have to be aware of both of those drivers. I would agree with that, if that's the, the thinking. Yeah, may I comment on this topic? Sorry, going ahead of you, but so um, from my perspective, this step that the Department of Energy and Transportation have, have taken with this joint office, I, I applaud that. It's unprecedented. Yes. Agreed. I think it's uh, showing leadership 
of America to the world as well. And to me, I'm trying to be, not trying to be, I want to be greedy and go to the next BHAG and bring in the regulatory piece in here as well. Because I think the opportunity is so significant to do a win-win situation around it. Mm -hmm. Today's regulatory approach, if you're looking at penetration rates of ZEVs by a certain time, puts the onus on manufacturers to make those vehicles available, which I think most manufacturers are up for or trying their best to make those vehicle models available. But what about the corresponding demand? If you're talking percent penetration, there has to be a business case of win-win for the customer as well. And I think therein lies the opportunity. If we don't mandate or incentivize the other elements at a very high level, product availability, infrastructure readiness, and cost elements, it may not necessarily be a win-win situation. And that was, I think, the opportunity if you're able to bring our EPA and CARB colleagues into this conversation, that to me would take this to the next level. And I would suggest it has to be firmly in scope. Yeah, I follow. Yeah, and I maybe just to, uh, I sat in on part of that conversation as well. Um, I think it would be hard to do our job well without acknowledging, recognizing the opportunities that regulatory agendas present, um, whether that's at the federal level, state level, local level, right? There's a lot of different layers there. And so I think the regulatory uh, discussion was around all of those. It's not just, you know, hey, we need to mandate this at this level. It's just kind of like how do we make sure that we're aligned in order to get the <coughs> that, that we agree to. Right. And I and I think I think it what I heard is both opportunity and risk yeah. in Rakesh's statement. And I think that's makes sense to me. Audience? Two things on regulatory, we did talk about that, and we talked about <coughs> what's in scope, out of scope. We certainly were talking about it in best practices, but also we were working under the assumption that jurisdictional, like what's within the federal jurisdiction is, stays within the federal jurisdiction, state and local, but understanding and identifying best practices. So I don't know if other groups address that, but that was one of our assumptions, uh, so something to discuss if, if others feel differently. and then. Um, certainly, I would say grid readiness, obviously big focus on battery electric vehicles, but when we're talking about hydrogen or anything else that's going to require electricity, right? It's actually hydrogen can be more intensive on electric, electric uh, generation, so it depends on the use case. But think again, just let's make sure we kind of um, think about the grid readiness in a comprehensive fashion. That's, that's all I have. Great. Um, Mike, wondering if you guys spent much time on kind of the equity, workforce development, supply chain side of medium and heavy duty. Um, just, I know that we talk a lot about, um, especially in port areas, right, medium and heavy duty electrification, electrification could really benefit the communities nearby, and those are often disadvantaged communities, underserved communities. Um, so I don't know if you guys have. We didn't get to it. Obviously, it's I mean it's it's in our minds in our discussions, but I don't think we spent time in the hour we had um, on anything uh, directly. I do think uh, there is a uh, by nature freight movement tends to be where populations are, or at least some of the um, uh, you know the the uh, domicile. Of, of or where these, where these truck stops, and not so much the truck stops, but where the uh, hubs are. They're around airports, they're around ports, they're around um, bypasses around the 20 major cities in the country, I mean, these big distribution things. And sometimes, uh, and so, um, and it tends to be where, you know, people are as well. So I think it's just by, by, it, we will be intent, I think we all need to be intentional about it, but. Um, in workforce, you know, medium and heavy duty has um, very different workforce considerations. Yeah, we did talk a bit. We did talk a bit satisfaction. about, and I mentioned it in my comments a little bit about um, uh, this. Do we need to win hearts and minds, or just minds? Uh, I thought that was a really. I don't know which one of us said it, but it was a pretty. I thought it was pretty dynamic and good. Good thought. Where 
Uh, and I mentioned it yesterday, we're getting the trucking industry excited about, you know, these uh, clean, great to drive. These are professional truck drivers. That's what they do. You know, they drive a lot. So if it's easier to drive it, that means a lot. So, so there's pieces of that, but that's a good reminder. Yeah, I'll just add that we, we touched a little bit on the workforce in the fact that um, if you look at the medium heavy duty space, like there are almost two different work streams in a way in terms of what's happening in heavy duty trucking, what's happening in transit, school buses, that world, where we did talk about like the workforce um, needs are going to be sequenced because you already see those needs in that transit school bus space. Whereas it's a little bit of a longer lead item in the trucking space, right? Because you don't have the, you just don't have that penetration in, in the, this other world, right? Of um, you know, if you look at private industry, public, you know, agency, where it's been ongoing and it's continuing, and those workforce needs are real and now. And so we talked a little bit about the fact that we had to go back to it, but it would maybe be a sequenced approach. Mark. Um. So, uh, out of respect for uh, some of the other policy offices that uh, the White House, um, on the regulatory side, the extent there are rules that are that are, you know, in process in consideration that impact medium heavy duty light duty, you should probably stay away from those, um, uh, just to make sure we're clear. But it does set up a, a question or concern uh, with regard to, uh, and, and I think Mike, you articulated it better, or maybe it was you, uh, that. There is, you know, as adoption comes on line for, for electric and hydrogen hangs out there as a second step, how does that, like, should we be addressing that piece, right, in terms of, it, is, our, is our remit to, to try to facilitate quicker adoption for uh, of electric, or are we also considering the fact that two, three years out, there may be better or more attractive hydrogen electric solutions? Um, I would love to spend an hour on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, uh, but I, do, I, I think, this, I, I think it's an and. It's not an, you know, I think trucking will be a battery electric trucks and hydrogen fuel cell electric trucks, not an or. So the, the discussion really becomes what's are the early adopters for battery going to, you know, how do we encourage that to move fast? And really a, a pretty nascent technology too that's going to improve, 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 and then see where hydrogen. We, if that's if that's sort of in line with your comment or question, um, I, think, uh, I think it's actually different. It, it, I, I appreciate that. Uh, so a medium is different than heavy in terms of technology. You know, uh, in, in investment, and I think its investment is the piece. Is that if I'm, you know, a trucking company trying to figure out where to invest, and I've got a compliance issue. And I've got to invest sometime soon, but if I can hold off and make the investment in hydrogen, I'm not going to make the investment in electric. And the consequence of that is uh, the climate impacts uh, uh, don't get addressed. Yeah, and, it, and it's actually more complex than that because of the <coughs> natural gas, natural gas idea, renewable natural gas, I and mean, there are fleets moving, you know, quickly with a better sustainability solution than what they have today. But that might classic bridge to nowhere. You know, that might be the bridge that they think is bridging them to that zero emission or that future. And so right. there's a lot, lot. So, so the question is, do we address that? Yeah. That the conundrum. Yeah. Uh, so that the industry is facing in light of potential rulemaking and yeah. in light of adoption. Yeah, I think that was in line with a, a, a fair amount of the conversation we had um, around some of these in and out. Um, Hydrogen, you know, just the actually even the discussion around hydrogen combustion versus hydrogen fuel cell. So I do think so um, the auto industry went through this uh, five to six years ago. You know, yep. and there was competing technology companies with different, you know, and, and you know, it, and uh, I think Sec Secretary Chu made a decision on which way at least the Obama administration was going that impacted that investment, and, and to me is where we are now. So I, 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 so I, you know, I, I'm not suggesting we saw it. I just was wondering. Yeah. Like, you guys know this stuff. I, I think spent an hour on it. Our, 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 well, yeah, our path forward was to create like position papers or some statements out of our subcommittee <laughs> around some of these awesome. points you're bringing up. So make them easy. I think your point is valid. 
competing technologies, if I can use that term. I'd like to believe it's a friendly competition, healthy competition. But even within a particular propulsion technology, there is also this generational effect. With every generation, we are improving that technology. And that's a question our customers are asking. Should they wait for the next generation because of cost improvements? And how much should they invest right now? What is the backwards compatibility? What type of parts and service support they can expect for the current generation? So even within a generation, considering how fast the technology is evolving or expected to, that's a, a very important topic as well. Excellent. Uh, you know, thank you. I look forward to the discussion. Two more? Yeah, I guess something I wanted to flag for the subcommittee is that for the state DOTs, you know, um, a key consideration is being able to you know, um, provide the roadway infrastructure that can accommodate, obviously, all sorts of vehicles. But the issue really, you know, uh, rises a lot in heavy-duty uh, vehicles, obviously. Uh, even the conventional heavy-duty trucks, you know, uh, the size and weight limits, uh, that's a conversation that's always taking place. And the added weight factor for heavy-duty EVs is already, I think, rising up in, you know, we're talking in Congress about, like, should there be a separate limit for EV trucks, but what does that then mean for infrastructure, you know, um, readiness, uh, and can it even accommodate, you know, something like that? So that's something I wanted to flag for you guys because even for non-heavy duty vehicles, what kind of shocked me the other day is that you know Connecticut has a number of parkways, right, that are only for light duty vehicles, but Connecticut DOT is banning Rivians on some of the parkways because the weight factor is already impacting their safety uh, and the ability again to accommodate such vehicles and that's something that we're looking at very closely and you know, offer that for suggestion. Yeah, just like to the extent that uh, postal when uh, uh, you know with the announcement of all electric they moved from the Ford Transit to the Ford E-Transit and the battery moved them from a light duty to, to, to your point. Nadine and I cook. Oh, um, I would say uh, just on the workforce development, I think we talked about that being potentially a universal partnership opportunity with everybody here because from the utility perspective, from the auto, from truck, I mean all of us, right, communities, getting ready the workforce that we're going to need to support this transition is absolutely critical and we need to start now. And so we thought that that was a great opportunity to partner. Um, and something that we should be thinking about, you know, probably shorter term to get started on. So just wanted to, I guess, talk about that. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, since John brought it up, the uh, safety issue in, in Metro Atlanta, we're conducting a regional plan on this whole thing, trying to achieve a lot of the, what we're trying to talk about here, but specific to that area. Some of the public safety folks are coming to us saying that they are concerned about incident response and uh, you know fire suppression and they're asking us to do like a risk assessment on pretty much all of our recommendations that from a public safety perspective so I I don't think we've talked about public safety yet so I just want I didn't know how that may be integrated if that's a I don't think that's a cross-cutting issue but um, I don't think we spent much time talking about that in our, at least in our subcommittee. But it sounds like an emerging issue. And I underline that. And I, I, have, <laughs> I have talked with the, the National Fire Chiefs Association, and they, they've uh, <coughs> continued to carry our water at, 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 this organ, at, this, at these meetings because this, uh, there are some significant public safety concerns. Uh, our local fire department, we roll on, on vehicle fires several times a day, and that's, a, that's an incident that's resolved in minutes, uh, unless it's an electrical vehicle, in which case sometimes it's resolved in days. And so we need to uh, uh, some figure out where that issue fits in this process. Can, can I just comment on that from the light duty manufacturer's perspective? I think this is an important conversation. We're already working with um, uh, fire organizations like the, the fire chiefs and others on exactly this, right? So there's a whole 
training aspect to this work, um, educating firefighters and fire departments about the technology and about fire suppression and the approaches. And I think, um, you know, we, we, that's, that maybe goes under the category of a, maybe a briefing that this task force might be able to benefit from is the current work being done and then we can identify what the gaps might be beyond that, and what we, what, you know, what the actual to do might be for this group. But I, you know, it is something that that I think, certainly from an auto manufacturer's perspective, we recognize, and we've already begun, you know, to develop best practices and training modules for that. Okay, we have time just for a few more comments. So, and then we're going to move over to our public comment period. So we'll do Dean Victoria. And Doug. Great. So I, th I think safety should always be number one. <clears throat> and it's number one for most of the truck stops, definitely for BP travel centers in America. If you haven't been to a truck stop, especially one that has a four court and 400 parking spots with eight bays, it's very busy. And now we're talking about introducing high power charging along with transitional fuels like hydrogen and renewable natural gas. There's a limit to the number of fuels since we're an integrated energy company. We provide whatever the customer wants, but you start introducing these alternative fuels, now you're messing with the operational flow of the, the truck stop, which is already at capacity. You're introducing fuels that are sometimes a little more flammable or highly com uh, combustible. <clears throat> so the safety factor always has to be top of mind, and I think on all these discussions, especially at a busy, busy truck stop with all these fuels, it needs to be one of the things we lead with. Yeah, thank you. I, I think it's a really great point, and um, we know that there's a lot of development activity to get, for example, first responders up to speed to give them the skills and the capabilities. <coughs> we don't expect that to be in place everywhere that we go. So our deployment plans include explicit outreach to first responders in each community where we plan to deploy, um, because we just don't know that everything will align in every community where we're going to be operating. So that's in our actual project plans to initiate that. Um, ourselves and make sure that the folks we partner with have that um, handshake. They know what we're deploying, what we're going to have where, and how we can work together for support. I was just going to say I 100% agree with Kofi and with Dean and others that it should be a cross-cutting issue. In addition to the fires, you've got uh, uh, the technicians need to be trained up on the high voltage systems under the hood. And emergency responders coming to crash sites also have to be very uh, conscious and well trained on dealing with the high voltage systems. Rachel, any final thoughts on this before we move over? Yeah, I, um, if I could have the liberty to, to do a little bit of maybe summarizing of a few key things that I'm hearing across these groups. Um, you know, I'm hearing uh, possibly some action, some next steps around what I was initially calling fast action memos, <laughs> but then Mike started talking about position statements, position papers. So it seems like there's maybe some low-hanging fruit of like, what do we need to address right now as an AV working group that we can vote on, that everyone can, you know, have the ability to weigh in on, develop, and you know, send that to the relevant agencies or whether that's the public, just make it make it available. Um, so I think there's that kind of activity. And that I think allows us a nimbleness to then do what I also heard, which was a lot of inventory, right? Like we need to spend some time like figuring out who's doing what, how it all fits together make sure that we're not duplicating work, but that takes time, right? It's going to take us a, a, probably a year to like get our feet under us, the four meetings with like multiple presentations on, you know, maybe there's public safety presentations. Um, I also heard uh, some presentations on um, cyber. So like I think there's a lot of different topical areas that we need to spend some time doing some inventory, figure out who the players are, figure out what the products are that are already available. But that doesn't lend itself to you know, making recommendations quickly. So um, maybe we need to figure out what topic areas kind of fit in the, like, what do we want to spend time on? What do we want to do very intentionally, very 
in a very educated way, and what do we want to do quickly? Like we we think we can get uh, agreement among this group on X position. Um, I also this bear with me here. Uh, I'm an engineer by training, so I just keep hearing requirements from each group, like. I want to do this, and we need a set of requirements that reflects the, the outcome that we want to get. And I hear it from medium and heavy duty, like, I need charging at this rate for this many trucks um, in this place. And then I hear it from the grid integration team, so I wonder if there's an opportunity here for us to be almost like an organization where there's a kind of an engineering department and there's the grid department, the medium heavy duty department, um, the charging network department, and we share with each other like what the requirements are for these solutions. And then that group can say, well, we can't deliver, you know, 16 megawatt charging, <laughs> but we can deliver four megawatt charging in this time frame. So I just I want to explore that idea of like how do we kind of tie people together on some common requirements. It might be around like use cases or specific solutions that we're seeking in, in the electrification space right now. But it just, I think we've got a lot of really uh, great people who can reflect on uh, different aspects of this. Like, you know, um, I think having a uh, Kofi and Mayor Giles here to, and, and Dean to reflect on, okay, like, you're going to put this big charger here, um, you know, how does it impact the community? How does it impact uh, the, the public safety? How does it impact, um, you know, what other fuels we're able to, to offer? So I just want to flag that as something that I think could be really unique and interesting about this group is like, maybe some some specific solutions that we each focus on what is required to make that a success um, and seeing what we, we, we can come up with as, as, a, as a team. I second that. And, uh, <laughs> that's a really good idea. Also, I wonder if there's some, you know, we talked about short-term, mid-term, long-term, maybe that's yep. also part of yep. that, you know, cross-reference <coughs> requirements, because we talked about in our group, so the requirements will change and evolve over time. So I think that's, that's a very actionable exercise, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. All right, well, yeah, yes. I think oh, what's also actionable is that you have the new NEVI system out in Ohio. Why not ask those questions a bit now so that we're collecting information in real time? That's so the yeah. way. Minimum standards require a certain amount of um, data to be collected from all the, the actually all the Title 23 stations. Well, um, the so actionable piece is taking the data, you, yeah. information you've heard today, ensuring that yes. it reflects that in your minimum standards. Yes. So minimum yep. standards become new minimum standards yep. based on the feedback collected today. That way it's timely. Yep. Yep. And the data too, right? right. Like the, uh, I, I would argue that we do have a bit of that already in place with the public comment period when we do notice of proposed rulemakings. Um, but definitely um, want to make sure that's getting to the right people. This is a great network too when, when those do open. Uh, that you guys are weighing in on it um, and that you're getting it out to your networks as well. Um, but I totally agree that, well, you know, it's, it's a whole cycle of um, how we evolve the, the whole um, electrification system. Okay, thanks for a great discussion. So even without the index cards, there was a, a lively uh, conversation. So thanks uh, to both groups that just presented. So now we're going to move to our public comment period. And then we'll take a break, um, but again, with these discussions and with the public comments, we hope this will just continue to inform and help you think through how you're going to take action on some of the priorities that you're considering. Um, so before we open it up, let me just run through this process. Um, so at this time, we're opening the meeting to hear public comments. 
please raise your hand if you pre-register to make a public comment and would still like to do so. You can do this by raising your hand within the reactions icon. Each individual will have two minutes to share their comment. When I call your name, please unmute yourself and turn your video on. If we do make it through all pre-registered commenters and time allows, we can ask others in attendance if they would like to comment. If we are unable to get to everyone during the next 30 minutes, we'd like to remind you that written statements can be sent to the working group's email address, bbwg at ee.doe.gov, or via email to Dr. Rachel Neeler, as described in the Federal Register Notice. Any statements received by December 20th will be included in the meeting notes to be posted to the website. Okay, so with that, uh, we will Wait, start. Can we do a quick audio test with our co-hosts online? Kristen or Haley, could you please test your audio? Yeah, uh, test, test, check, check. How does that sound? Perfect, thank you, Kristen. Yep. Great. First, um, I will call on Sharky Rubana. Can you unmute yourself? I am unmuted, uh, but uh, struggling to see. Uh, I don't seem to have the camera option. Oh, uh, I we're okay with proceeding and we'll try to get that set up, but why don't you go ahead? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, hello, EV working group members. Uh, my name is Sharky Iguana. I'm the president of the American Car Rental Association. Our membership operates just about every rental car on the road, collectively over 1.7 million vehicles and includes all of the major companies such as Avis, Enterprise, Fox, Hertz, and Sixth, uh, but also hundreds of small business operators like myself. To the best of our knowledge, we own more EV vehicles than any other sector in America. As the largest fleet operator of EV cars, we've been on the tip of the spear of EV adoption and have the scrapes and bruises to prove it. Uh, we have a substantial amount of real world operating experience and would like to offer that experience to the working group at your convenience. This is an important issue for us and we're paying close attention to these meetings. On behalf of the association, we want to thank all of the EV working group members for volunteering your time on this incredibly important issue. And we look forward to working with you all as the group uh, moves forward with its recommendations. Uh, as we've heard, less than 1% of the vehicles currently registered in the US are electric. The point I'd like to make is that most Americans have not had a chance to drive an EV yet. And many, if not most, consumers will have their first experience driving an EV in a rental car context. We want to make sure that experience is a positive one, and I'm sure you'll agree that's in all our interests. Accordingly, we want to encourage this working group to keep a close eye on making sure there is sufficient charging capacity where people are likely to have their first contact with EVs, such as airports, uh, and to also ensure that charging capacity is sufficient in close proximity to their most likely destinations, including hotels, convention centers, tourist attractions, and other travel destinations. With over 16,000 locations across the United States, our members, both large and small, want to emphasize that we have thousands of locations in economically disadvantaged areas. We are grateful for those that have mentioned concerns about equity and site placement, and we want to express our support and alignment with that concern uh, and hope that we can uh, ensure uh, equitable distribution of, of sites throughout the US. Finally, as a small business advocate and small business owner myself, I also want to encourage the working group to think about making sure that small businesses have an opportunity to participate in and around charging site locations. Small businesses are a critical part of the nation's economy and making sure they are included in this transition, I think is important for the robustness of our economy moving forward. Uh, again, in closing, thank you all for your contributions to this working group. We're paying uh, very close attention, uh, a lot of great comments and uh, have been learning a lot as we've been following along. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Colleen Quinn. Hi, uh, everyone. Um, can you hear me, Rachel? Yeah. Cool, great. Hi, everyone. Um, and thank you all for uh, getting together. 
I'm Colleen Quinn. Um, know many of you, I'm the co-administrator of the National EV Charging Initiative and founder of eMobility Advisors. Um, my background is as a pioneer in the EV charging industry for over a decade. I served as the principal government and policy strategy officer at ChargePoint. I now have been working uh, with a very, um, which we think is a very important initiative called the National EV Charging Initiative, which we started in 2020 to provide a framework uh, to engage relevant stakeholders, many like yourself, both public and private, laying out how everyone involved would help deploy a national charging network for light duty, uh, heavy duty, uh, et cetera, vehicles to meet the aggressive air quality, climate, job creation, and equity goals um, that we are all uh, you know, basically trying to achieve. Um, one of the things I just wanted to comment on about uh, the great work that you all are doing is to really encourage you. I've heard a lot of discussion, um, and I think John Bozella mentioned it. Um, Rachel, you also kind of summarized it. Um, the rep from Daimler Trucks, the importance of regulation um, in this whole strategy. I want to mention that one thing that I hope that the groups that both the grid group as well as the medium heavy duty and even the light duty will look at some of the important things that have already happened in states. Um, I, you know, thinking about regulations or, and legislation as well that have addressed things, for example, like um, legislation in California very early on to enable um, uh, 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 the um, reducing upfront costs to enable the utility to um, basically rate base, make ready formulas. Um, I mean, this is a Again, these are state regulatory activities, but I hope that you will take a look at those. Um, the same thing with um, was mentioned today about demand charges, the need to make this a business successful uh, venture. You know, there are legis there's you know the IIJA pro actually projected uh, upon the regulatory commissions to begin to take up and look at demand charge reform. Um, this will you know, cut the cost of overhead costs for being able to um, cite EV charging. And then also I want to mention, it was discussed, you know, this paradigm between the, regula the regulatory agencies putting regulations on um, the automakers and the medium heavy duty makers. Um, but we also need to do the also understand, you know, the demand side of getting the consumer and getting ready for what those regulations envision. So I want to mention a bill that happened in California, SB 410, that basically requires the California PUC to put together a shot clock on the energization timetable um, for, you know, energizing, especially looking at the medium heavy duty industry's needs. So these are things that I hope you guys will take into account. The work that we're gonna be doing next year uh, in the initiative is actually taking these best practices and introduce them into legislation um, as we go. So just wanted to thank you very much for what you're doing and make sure that this, this you know these regulations are a part um, of your best practices and also of your uh, work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gregory Scott. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, can you speak a little louder, please? <clears throat> sure. No, that, that's never been a problem, according to my, my elementary school teachers. First of all, uh, <laughs> thank you uh, for inviting me to talk today. I, I'm not going to repeat Sharkey's uh, comments. I work with the American Car Rental Association, but perhaps uh, hit on some points in, in, in between his points. As he mentioned, um, we have about two, two, 215,000 EVs in the global rental fleet today. 75,000 of those are in the United States. So that's about 1% that's about of, the, of the, the fleet overall. 50% of our rentals take place at airports. And so as I hear people talk about uh, uh, electricity 
uh, demand hubs or, or, or concentrations. I encourage the, the working group to take a look at airports. We certainly are and talking to the airports and the FAA uh, about you know, the, the freight operations that take place at airports, the, you know, the obviously the airline uh, operations, uh, catering, uh, tugs, uh, uh, parking and, and car rental will take place there as well as the shuttle buses. A huge electricity demand is, it takes place at airports. And uh, we are hoping that as DOT and DOE look at this, that they bring in all of the modes uh, uh, within DOT, including FAA, to take a look at uh, some of the solutions. Because about um, uh, the, one of the points you all were talking about was data. And I think this is probably something that folks around the table are aware of, but there is no requirement under federal law for an electric vehicle to have an OBD2 port or a, a portal to harvest data or to, or to uh, uh, transmit data through telematics. California has re recently adopted regulations to require uh, there to be an OBD2 port in EVs, but that's something that's not uh, uh, in place in, in federal law. Uh, simply because EVs have no emissions, and that's the only reason that you need an OBD, OBD2 port under the Clean Air Act. So the, the working group may want to take a look at that. And then finally, I'll comment on safety and the fact that many of the consolidated rental facilities that we have at, at our nation's airports, that I'm sure you all have used, uh, were not built for EVs. They were built, as people were talking about, uh, the gentleman I think from Astro said that the, the roads were not built to handle this, these uh, weight of vehicles and neither were these uh, parking uh, structures. And it's something we need to work on uh, with the airports. And we're also working on with the fire chiefs because the fire chiefs are very concerned about having uh, these vehicles in uh, parking structures at airports. Um, and it needs to, that needs to be addressed uh, as things go forward. So we look forward to, I appreciate all of the comments from people today. We look forward to working with you and we'll probably submit some uh, formal statement uh, for the record um, as, as suggested. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any other uh, members of the public who would like to provide a comment at this time? If so, please raise your hand. And if there's anyone else who would like to submit a public comment at this time, please raise your hand. Seeing none, we will close the public comment period. Thank you for those who participated. Um, so we are ahead of schedule, um, which can give us more time uh, in our subcommittees to talk about next steps. Um, but Rachel on the fly, well, let's figure out our game plan. Let's let's break and, and then go directly into the subcommittees. Maybe I'll just take the review of the meeting schedule and stuff and kind of stick that at the end so people can have plenty of time to talk. Um, and also, you know, take a phone call if you need to, go to the restroom, etc. cetera, um, grab some water. Um, so maybe we reconvene at, uh, so I, I, I don't believe we have, Rooms and we're we're not we weren't going to use the rooms again, right? We're just gonna right. We're gonna huddle up. here. Although yeah. Julie, could I ask you to just check outside if there's any rooms in the in the conference center for you? They had said we could just check. Um, so <laughs> yeah, the idea is we would huddle here. So maybe three fifteen, we would come back for report outs, and then you could review the milestone schedule. Would that work? Yeah, I think that sounds great. Okay, um, so. Take a break, as Rachel mentioned, and linger here. The groups can <coughs> find space in the corners of this room. And then if we have some space in the conference center that's available, we'll let you know so you can spread out a little bit. I would like to mention right before we break, um, I, did, I did notice one win. Um, so while I asked everyone to develop a scope, and as usual, scoping activities, there are more things in scope than out of scope. <laughs> but. Um, I think we have ruled out, you know, any, and, and it is aligned with our legislative language, but maritime um, air travel of electrification did not come up. So I think we're well aligned. We're talking about roads. Uh, we're talking about deploying um, EVs on the roads. So I'll, I'll take that as a win. Good job, guys. <laughs> big, big, huge sectors. 
that are out, out of scope. <laughs> okay, so take a small break and then form back into your subcommittees. And for the public, we'll be coming back around 3.15 for report outs from the group. And as a reminder, your subcommittee meetings are to, to identify those immediate next steps. What are you doing? Who's doing it? When are you going to do it? Um, and then we'll talk larger schedule as a working group. Okay, thanks. So the groups you had, I know time went by too fast, uh, but hopefully you were able to work through some of your immediate next steps. Um, I think we will go in the order that we did our last round and hear your top, you said three to five, I think, top three to five actions, uh, specifically the, the what, when, and who. Um, and we'll try to, yes. Can, can I do like a quick topper? Yes. Okay. Good. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. Um, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we heard from a couple of you some logistical things that you guys are thinking of, um, like file sharing and um, how we share materials, um, etc. So um, I want to uh, say that the, the team working on the EV working group will come up with a solution relatively quickly. Um, at least an intermediate uh, solution. I would say if it is something that needs to be circulated to the whole EV working group or you, you know, maybe it's a report or something that comes across your desk in the next couple weeks and you don't want to lose sight of it, you can always email it to evwg at ee.doe.gov. Um, it's managed by a couple of us here um, and we can at least have that as a as a um, intermediate repository of resources um, just so that as they come up, you guys are, are thinking of it and can send it there. And then once we do find a file sharing place, um, we'll make sure everyone has that information. Great. Okay, so we'll still ask maybe five-ish minutes for your report out so that we can talk bigger picture also before we adjourn and get you out on time. Um, so network charging, charging networks, would you like to go first? Okay. So um, <coughs> high, high level, um, we started with um, a series of next steps associated with inventory, right? We need to understand, for example, current research and current projections with regard to the total number of charging stations required for a given level of EV penetration. There's lots of work being done on this. NREL's doing work, California Energy Commission's done some work, <coughs> lots of different. So we, 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 first thing we need to do is gather that and, and make sure that we have some sense of what the, the sort of center of gravity is with regard to that. So there's a big piece of inventory um, gathering there um, um, with, regard to, um, um, with regard to that. Um, the, the other uh, thing we did was, in addition to inventory gathering, we realized there need to be a set of metrics associated with our public goods goals. So we want to define what we mean and how we would measure accessibility, affordability, availability, reliability, sustainability. And that's going to take a little bit of time, and we think it's going to require outreach beyond the um, the expertise and perspective of our subcommittee, right? So um, that's something that um, between Kelsey and I, Kelsey's going to help us do some of that inventory work, and I think um, some of that projection work aligns with work you're currently doing. Um, I'm going to add some projection perspectives from the auto industry with regard to EV market growth. Um, but we're going to, back to the metrics, have to sort of cast a broader net, right? So our plan is to use our individual networks and come back together at some point soon and certainly well before the next meeting and compare notes on what we think those key metrics are going to be in those, uh, in defining those public goods. Um, can I ask a clarifying question on that? When you're casting the broader net for metrics, are you casting a broader net at uh, what metrics should be included, how they are defined, or both? Both. Okay. It has to be both, right? So um, we had a debate about a number of different metrics that we think ought to be included. Um, but we also need to further define them, right? Um, 
um, you know, we think there are some metrics, for example, um, you know, with regard to the general state of the development of the network, which are, you know, easy to understand. In other words, the GD Power point of view about EV market growth rates versus charging growth rates and that delta, that two and a half to three times growth delta between the two is an indication of sort of a broad macro uh, metric that can tell us whether we're closing the gap. In other words, we're on track or whether the gap is expanding, meaning we're off track. But we also have to define the metrics that will determine an outcome, right? How many charging stations at what point, at what point should we be at in 2027, 2030, say for example, 2032 and beyond. And the metrics you're talking about are specific to your subcommittee and maybe more broadly applicable? Both. I think they're both. Um, you know, one of the things we talked about is, and this is applicable, to, I think, to all three, is the work that, um, um, what's the, we were just, EVs to scale. EVs to scale. Like many of us are doing work on EVs to scale, right? So we think that some of the work they're doing you know, can provide us with some metrics. There's especially great work being done in the heavy duty space in that work group, you know, and given load demands is gonna be, you know, helpful to like doing as well. Any questions or anyone else from your group want to add anything? Okay. Oh yes. Yeah. yeah, we we discussed some of the some of the portions with the sustainability of, of the network and some of that, like with some workforce development and things like that, and, and reaching out to some maybe of the organizations which could be providing, say, that technical assistance to figure out maybe what a metric would look like in, in that realm of building out, say, how much training has been offered and how, how much is being attended if you put that out there um, and I'm not sure you're aware of that training because it could come through an LTAP or a tribal technical assistance program or or where that may be just to have some sort of metric to say who, who's how much is being utilized and and what are the opportunities to maybe offer more or, or a larger variety of that and then just a metric of sustainability as far as a business standpoint and, and economic development and the things of, of that nature. I think there's ways to build metrics in there where you can read the success stories of, of that on both of those ends. Yeah, perfect, perfect ads. I, I, one other thing, I'm just now, I'm looking at the list again. Um, we're, we're trying to figure out how, what, what, what the appropriate metric is with regard to cost of the fuel, quote unquote, right? The cost of electricity vis-a-vis -vis the cost of gasoline. Like that, that, that is something that comes up in the context of home charging. It comes up in the, in the case of DC fast charging, public charging. Um, and so I think we need to think about that and how we, you know, what, what, what is that metric? Is there a metric? Is there an appropriate metric that indicates, you know, the, the, what we should be targeting with regard to cost of, of the electricity in this context? Thank you. Okay, grid integration. What are your immediate next steps? Well, we're going to meet next week. Setting the bomb. You're spending the holidays together. You can meet over the weekend just so that. Okay, medium heavy duty. Watch out. Okay. So we were looking at kind of diving in a little bit more while everything's still fresh. Uh, and to the inventory, we talked a lot about that. There may be a chance we were saying that there's some common themes through the inventory and even just talking about this here, some of the cross cuts might be, you know, ways to look at it. But for grid readiness, we talked about capacity, we talked about EVs to scale, are there other areas? We also kind of grouped federal maybe versus non-federals studies and work and modeling that's going on and Mark who's who's not here right now so we can just assign everything to Mark. No, Mark graciously I think agreed to help kind of push forward some of the inventory of the federal work that's going on. 
you know, our hope would in an ideal world to have that both federal and non-federal at least as draft by January or by for the January report, just to what we know of. So um, I think some of the things you were talking about jogged some themes we didn't expressly talk about, but we're like, what are we going to inventory? So maybe there's an opportunity for all of us to think about what are universal things we want to think about, and then we can add on specific components. Like for grid readiness, we're thinking about capacity, um, timelines, uh, you know, maybe there's a cost component, average costs, you know, what does it take to build out certain infrastructure or estimates? Um, what are some of the uh, other, you know, what are some of the solutions like managed charging, thinking about ways that we can also potentially offset the need for certain grid uh, infrastructure or being a very efficient there. And so looking at what information and studies and data are out there. We also talked about building codes. Yep. We thought that might go into some of the other areas. But when you're thinking about grid readiness, that's going to be, you know, pulling the permits, doing the siting, doing the upgrades. And in, like, dense urban locations, for example, that can be very challenging, whether it's your siting a DCFC or you're building a new feeder to get or upgrading a substation, right? So we were talking about best practices there. Um, and we like, I team, do you guys agree? I like the metrics kind of starting to define that. We didn't get there, but we could certainly discuss that next week um, and borrow some of your ideas of how, what's in scope and how are you defining those? Uh, we didn't quite fully get there, but that's something we could look at. So. Um, what did I leave out? Okay. Could I um, piggybacking a little bit on what you've said, Nadia? Um, <clears throat> so you're both talking about inventories. I think that's really important um, for us to start uh, with. I would like to um, propose that um, I don't know if it's through the subcommittees or maybe it's just a poll of everyone here in the committee. Like, what do you want inventories on so that we can start collecting, um, you know, the commonalities between them. Maybe some of it falls to the subcommittees to do if it's more detailed and specific, but maybe it's also things that this whole group would like. So um, what are the inventories that we'd like to see? Uh, maybe first top one or two priorities. And then I think the other thing that I've heard is what are the fast actions? What are the maybe memos that we want to consider or positions that we want to consider? Uh, would also like to hear from the group, like what are the top one or two that you think would be valuable for this group to tackle first? Um, and then we can serve as a coordinating um, small team um, and then real, real, apply back to the subcommittees, like, here are the ones that kind of fall under your bucket, you know, what do you guys think is, is reasonable, um, here's what falls into charging network, here's what falls into medium heavy duty grid integration, etc. Um, but I think getting some ideas on um, where, where we might want to first focus our attention in those two, like, the longer term planning thing will be helpful for us because then we can start lining up presentations. Um, and then for the memos and things, like maybe there are things that we already feel like we're pretty aligned on that we want to have presentations on or memos to the chairs of the, the committee, et cetera, or publicly available. Yeah, we did talk about one um, that we had mentioned earlier, and that was uh, supply chain. That we thought there could be some fast action because we know there's been work with, you know, DOE and others. And just from a national security standpoint, you might take transformers, for example. Yep. But that would be one area. And some are longer term. I mean, we were talking about that kind of comprehensive planning. I don't know that we could get that done in the you know, short term, but thinking about pulling all of these pieces together sooner rather than later. We probably wouldn't want to wait till the full report to, right, to have a, you know, some best practices out there. Um, but that was one that we thought was pretty time sensitive and a lot of work we think is going on there. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much.
All right. Oh, oh yes. Yeah, sorry. Sort of, I have sort of a general question on. So, so like on. So I agree that it's it's useful to have a common frame of reference for these inventories of what's going on, but I'm also very well aware that there's a lot of work that goes into once you have that, someone has to read that, understand what the key takeaways are, how it interfaces or aligns or doesn't with the other 20 resources in that repository, and then what can we take action? Like, there's a lot of analysis and integrative thought that has to go into that. And I just wonder, I guess I'm kind of wondering how we're going to manage all of that, right? Because we're talking about there's a lot of efforts. There's a lot of resources. How do we get from inventorying all these different efforts that are going on to distilling, here are a couple actions. Like, I just don't know, you know, who, who, how, how's that going to happen? How are we going to do that? Is that like, do we have to do that? <laughs> you know, like, how, how are we going to manage that? Because that's going to take a lot of time and effort. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a good question. I'm not going to say that we have it 100% figured out. Um, that's why I'm trying to propose maybe a couple of smaller things, quick things that we can do and kind of set up the process. Like, for example, I was, I was talking to Daniel on the side. You know, um, is it going to be more like the model that we've already put forth, which is basically like, you guys come talk to us. We come up with a nice, catchy figure. I circulated it out to the group. And I get a little bit of feedback, any like tweaks here and there, and then that's kind of how we move forward. Perhaps that's the model for some things. Maybe there are other things that people are going to feel more strongly about. They would like to take a lead on and uh, be, maybe it's uh, someone that's leading a subcommittee and they decide, you know, we want to write the report and then we will circulate it to the broader group and get some feedback on. We need to have a discussion about it. So I think uh, because we're not marrying ourselves to, you know, only writing reports or only doing men memos, I think we're going to have to figure out how to match the message with the product. And I think the model for how we do that is going to depend on both of those things, message and the product. So um, if you bear with me, <laughs> I am also someone that loves process and organization. I promise to um, steer you in the, in the right direction, try to clarify things as much as possible, but I think we're still maybe a little bit in the um, sausage making of like, what do we want to make this? Um, and uh, <coughs> getting up to the subcommittees, giving us some, some action items to the next meeting might help us uh, better understand um, how it's going to work. And it might be different per topic, right? Maybe the grid integration team um, really wants to dig into things and come up with, or, I mean, I heard you guys say, medium and heavy duty, we're like, we have positions, <laughs> right? We want to put out positions on all of these things, um, and we're, we're feeling good about that. So maybe you guys are taking a, a strong hand in developing that and then circulating it to the group. Maybe other things like the um, the discussion that we're distilling into this potentially first report, um, that's going to be very staff heavy, right? Like we'll take take that back, we will write it, and we will circulate it to the team and make sure that people feel good about it. So I hate to say it's case by case and not give you a very clear answer, but I want the message and the substance to drive us and we will figure out like what the pathway is and what the mechanism is together. Is that a reasonable answer? Because um, we can also take back, Laura, like feedback that we need a, a clear governance, clear clear process of how we get these things done if, if we think that's that's needed. Maybe a little of both. So I suggest we hear from yep. Medium Heavy Sorry. Duty. And then um, with all of this and talking about our milestones and next steps um, for what you'll, you'll share, we can figure out some of those plans. OK. Mike. 
also in the next three months, um, we we um, kind of work on uh, prioritizing and sequencing, defining requirements, and some of these. Um, I love the word positions, but these statements, positions, um, uh, papers, or whatever. Uh, and so, what we're going to do is we're going to do a monthly meeting, but we've also identified volunteers for each of those three to um, to kind of lead the process over the next few months. For instance, um, around priorities and sequencing specific things that that we think should be on the table to do with respect to medium and heavy duty, uh, Rakesh volunteered to like do some duty cycle TCO examples, so some market segment. Um, case studies maybe might be a way to talk about it to uh, to both look at um, where we have successes to, to get that snowball rolling as well as um, uh, where are some pretty defined short-term things that need to happen to to uh, increase the adoption of electric trucks um, so we've got um, like three of us are going to work on each of these three items over the next three months, three by three by three, um, to, uh, to to move the ball forward. We, 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 and we got into some definition around it, but, but um, kind of letting the process get us to the next meeting. Any questions there or comments? Okay. So now we'll bring it back to what you were really just discussing about our next steps. Yeah. and. Your, the schedule you have in mind, how you'd like to move forward. Okay. So um, maybe leaving the easiest to last, which is when should we meet again? <laughs> um, you know, I'd like to talk a little bit about expectations for the next meeting. You know, um, I'd like to repeat back some of the presentations, some of the topic items that I've heard so far that I would like to start, you know, three months is very, very short. Um, and I don't want to be calling people like Mike Roof on Friday before the meeting, <laughs> um, recognizing that we have a gap in medium and heavy duty uh, as a presentation. So I would like to get started on, on those things. So I would ask that if anyone has any suggestions for um, work that's being done, people that are doing it that could come and present, um, please send that to our email. Um, and we can start collecting those. The few that I heard so far is we need a little bit more information on cybersecurity, what work is being done where, um, public safety, what work is being done where. Um, I think I also heard some early potential action on kind of like workforce um, across the subcommittees, and so maybe pulling together some efforts that are happening both in industry and in government around workforce. Um, so those are kind of the big nuggets of things that uh, I'm taking away as far as presentations. Um, maybe that's also uh, figuring out how our, I think, understanding where you guys are thinking on inventories will be helpful for us in developing the programs as well. So uh, don't think that any of that is, is uh, baked. I think that's just the beginning of some things that were discussed here, but I'd like to follow up with each of you on like, what do we need to start inventorying over time? Because it will, it will take us time. I think it's important to recognize that it will take us time to have a common understanding of these like big hairy issues, right? Um, and, and then that will allow us more more information on how, how do we even come to an agreement um, on, on these issues. Like, it might require us to have a handful of presentations, a handful of meetings, subcommittee committees to meet before we can kind of formulate it. But I have a sneaky suspicion that there are a couple uh, topics or um, specific, uh, you know, things that we we can largely agree on that you know is low hanging fruit needs that quick action, and that's kind of where I want to target the memos is like. Can we identify a, a problem that needs a solution that this group thinks they can work on quickly and then identify like who is going to be the lead on that? Who's gonna drive what that memo looks like, you know, how we're collecting the information, what the end recommendation is, and that will be circulated to the full group to weigh in on. 
Um, so inventories and memos. I'd also like to start building a repository of examples and best practices. I think that's, we've heard a lot of that. I think we have a lot of capacity in this room to, um, uh, to crowdsource lots of uh, good examples and bad examples, honestly. Things that haven't worked before and that we need to learn lessons from. Um, so I would like to also ask people, uh, this is also uh, very aligned with uh, something that I'm trying to do in the joint office, which is we are a, techn a, a, a technical assistance organization. I want to make sure that the people that are working on these things are getting access to these best practices, to these examples, <coughs> um, to the things that have worked and the things that haven't worked. So I would uh, offer up that pending GC allows me to, that as we start collecting things, I can start putting them, or I can have work with the team to put many of these things on our website. And we can have, you know, not only the EV Working Group website, that's part of driveelectric.gov right now, but it can link to many other uh, resources and start building that as, as a team. Because a key principle within the joint office is that this is not just whole of government, this is whole of stakeholder, and so I want that to be reflected in the resources that, that we have as well. Um, so I also think that if we build up that best practices of like the things that have happened before, that's also, and this is something I think the, the working group staff can do, is if you, if you guys deliver that to us, we can take a little bit of an inventory on where there might be gaps in those best practices, where we might be, it might be worth focusing our time to either develop new best practices or you, uh, the working group kind of develops recommendations to the government on how to develop best practices. Like I actually think that there's probably a lot of resources out there already that can guide where it's most impactful to, to spend our time. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I would say is on deck for uh, the staff working on EV Working Group is lining up the presentations, um, being the repository for the inventory as well as best practices, and then starting to help catalyze what these um, fast actions or memos might be um, so that we can, whether it's we can help with writing or we can help pull, with re pull resources to inform these memos. Um, and someone else would do the writing if they wanted to volunteer. Um, I think that's kind of where we fit and what, what is expected from us in the next three months. But I'd love to hear if, if others see other valuable actions that we as the EV Working Group staff can help with in the meantime. Go ahead. And the inventory, I just wanted, just hearing the discussion, it was good. Um, I think, at least I was, I don't know how other members were thinking about it, is the initial pass, just inventorying what's out there, not, you know, just the subject matter. So NREL has done a study on this, um, EPRI has done that, EEI has done this, just, just so you have like a list so you know kind of four folks have done a study on rate design or whatever the topic might be, I don't know. But probably out of scope, but uh, that that type of thing. So, yep. Just wanted to clarify that. Yep. Yes, I was. <laughs> I was. I think we're going to have to be. Um, there are trade-offs, right? So we could spend all of our time reading all of these reports and getting up to speed on them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that then we're going to have time to actually make <coughs> recommendations in a responsive way, right? So, um, and I certainly, I, I have my main day job uh, as well as you guys. You know, I don't, I'm not going to, I promise, I promise in advance, I will not send 400 page packets for you guys to read before you get to the EV working group meetings, <laughs> okay? Um, but I do think we've, we've got to figure out the best way, the most effective way, fastest way to all get up to speed on sim similar things so that we can have really robust discussions around the recommendations. So I do think the future EV working group meetings are going to be more about discussing, discussing, hashing things out, and um, maybe they're topically focused. Maybe we have, you know, 
we have three subcommittees, maybe it's every subcommittee reports um, out on their activities and gets input for the PB working group for three of them, and then we have kind of a, a wrap-up one uh, each year. So I think we have a lot of work to do to figure out what this what this framework is, but um, but I'm I'm confident that we will be able to get there together. We have a few Michael's comments. I'm going to oh start with Michael, who's on Zoom. Hmm. Um, just uh, on on that last point, and um, Rachel is absolutely right. Like you know. I'm, I'm the first one to ask for a thousand things, then I may not have time to read them all. So I think we got to manage that. There is, I think one thing that I do appreciate me right here, this is a little bit of some of the comments is, um, you know, all of you are identified members of the EV working group, like we want to EV working group. People in general, um, in the public and in your constituencies that you represent are expecting you probably to be like somewhat experts on all things EV, you're experts in your area, but kind of how do people feel comfortable they're experts in other areas? Um, so I think, some of the basic things we do want to make sure like you know the basic of like what's happening in the ev market sales kind of a little bit more top of line type of stuff um so we can work a little bit towards some of that where it's not like becoming an expert on an in-depth you know 40 page report but more like oh here's once a month the 10 page sales update that kind of we do or something like that where you can kind of be all having the same general information know what's going on um seeing fact-based type of thing for the, the high level pictures and then uh, if there you know if there are areas right where people feel like you know i need more background maybe that's something we could do just like a survey like are there specific areas where people say they really would like a little more we could do like a uh you know a, a quick uh webinar on all things you know vehicle grid integration or something like for an hour with one of our best experts or an update on um battery critical minerals or something like that where you just kind of provide any you know just whoever's interested uh just needs a little bit of refresher on some of that or needs an update from things we could provide so a few, few possibilities there yeah i think that's great michael and we already are very practiced at webinars in the joint office and so uh, i think it's uh, a good highlight to say you know we don't have to do all the catching up together sitting in a room watching presentations right um, we can also um, utilize existing resources, which is my favorite thing to do. Um, uh, but also, if there are you know specific things that the EV working group wants to know a little bit more about, we can um, work on exactly that. You know, pulling together a presentation, recording it, making sure that you guys have access to it so that you can uh, watch it on your your own time in preparation. Um, Cassie, John, and Kofi. Uh, process question. Can you guys just maybe share with us at some point any rules or requirements around advisory groups so that we know to what extent we should be volunteering our time, our staff's time, engaging our memberships on certain discrete deliverables that are coming out of this, just in case there are any requirements or rules that we should be aware of and be helpful to know up front. Yep. I will take that back and I will, I won't share a bunch of them now. I will Put it in writing so that everybody has it and they can refer back to it. <laughs> but yes. I just want to endorse the idea of kind of giving a running report on how we're doing on the website, you know, posting articles that we're considering, or because people are going to be asking us, how's it going? And I think saying, oh, wait for two years and I'll tell you, <laughs> you know, it's probably not the best answer. So, uh, and, and to the point of, you know, there's going to be thousands of pages of data that are going to be thrown at us. I think, you know, the, there's a couple hundred people on the, watching this meeting right now. I think and we, we can crowdsource a lot of that. We'll get a lot of feedback where people will say, oh, whatever you do, don't read this article because it's garbage. Or, you know, what, there'll be a, an interesting, healthy discussion that will contribute to the transparency of what we're doing and probably end up with, with a better uh, product at the end. Yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, Rachel, you mentioned earlier before the break the um, that exercise with the requirements. Like, yeah. Is that, how did that fit into the next steps or even next meeting? How about I take that on, since it was my idea, <laughs> and flesh it out a little bit more of how, I'm, how that might work um, and bring it back to the, the working group. I think that's probably more of a, a long 
not not super long term. Like I don't want to deliver something in a year, but I think it's something that um, it might take a little bit of fleshing out of the idea. Was just kind of a it struck me um, that we might be able to kind of be our own engineering and design team, kind of working together on coming to a common set of requirements and solving some of these these issues. Um, so let me flesh it out a little bit more. I will take that on myself. Um, and get back to you how it might work. I don't see any other tents. Oh, sorry. I have to the periphery thing. Please go. Sorry. Just a point of clarification, Rachel. Yes. Um, when you're mentioning memos, position papers, etc., are those expected to be products of the entire EV working group, of subcommittees, of subcommittees to the working group, and then et cetera? Can you just? Yeah. So we will have to run to ground what the working group is able to put, like, is it called a position paper? Is it, you know, there's probably some legal constraints that we don't have top of mind right now. So let me run to ground like what that actually looks like. But it would be a product of the EV working group, and all the subcommittee products would also be a product of the EV working group. Um, in that, you know, as I said, we can engage more people on the subcommittees, uh, but anything that is produced by the subcommittees has to come back to the original committee to be then um, agreed upon. So um, everything will have to have to come back to this group, um, even if it's a subcommittee product. Okay, now I don't see any more tents. Um, so Rachel, do you want to discuss the next meeting? Yeah, so I think we're uh, looking at the um, April time frame, um, right? February, March, March, April time frame. Um, I just wanted to give people the opportunity to hear say, you know, looks like there's a great event happening in DC. <laughs> in March, April that uh, we want to take into consideration that people might be traveling here for anyways, um, or uh, maybe just an open question that if you have a uh, personal vacation planned or you know some big work event or something, you're like, I really can't do it this week or that week, um, we have some flexibility to schedule. I see Sarah with her hand up and Mike with his hand up. As a local, can you remind me when the cherry blossom season is? I feel like mm -hmm. that is probably a bad time that we should April wave. Yep. Is that March? It's It's getting earlier and earlier. Yeah. 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 Do do meetings have to be here? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I'm looking I didn't have any, any uh, <laughs> agenda there. <laughs> well, the reason I bring it up is, you know, there are, uh, you know, some conferences or events that might mean a lot to all of us, um, where we could co-locate a team meeting there, and we could get some. Maybe there'd be some opportunity for collaboration with broader groups or whatever. Just, that was my yep. reason. Yep. Um, Let's explore it. I don't want to say no, um, but I have heard there are additional logistical issues um, when you don't hold it in DC. But I have to double check that. Um, that's based on an experience with another FACA. Um, so I'll have to double check on that. So right now I say the world is our oyster. Not literally, because if we went to Hawaii or something as an EV working group, I'm not sure I could justify that. <laughs> But I do think that, um, you know, if it's co-located at not only an event, but something we want to see. Um, Danielle and I were talking about potentially um, seeing a, a demonstration in Montgomery County that's nearby here. Um, so I think, I think we can brainstorm now um, and then down select later when I have a little bit more information. Anything else you want to cover? No, we'll, send, uh, we'll make sure to send up a follow-up email, uh, especially of these things that I've asked of you <laughs> in the last half hour. 
um, so that I'm getting the feedback early enough so that we're able to plan um, the next one um, soon. We'll try to get a uh, hold on your calendar. Maybe I'll maybe we'll do a little poll uh, of, of specific times um, and start holding it on people's calendar um, so that they can start planning. And our invitational, our fantastic invitational travel team um, can start helping people travel where they need to go. Sometime in April is what we're thinking. Yeah, late March, early April, probably. You might have spring break. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you can have a couple of options, March. that'd be great. Yes, because of spring there will be a couple break. options. Yep. Um, great. Well, then I might take the last minute and March. just say thank you all for joining us here today. I think this was a really great in-person kickoff meeting. Um, I feel energized by all the conversations. I think it's a great way to end the year, in fact. Um, I want to especially thank Rachel Sack for helping us facilitate <laughs> Sarah Emmons, our deputy DFO and IT guru now. <laughs> and then a lot of prep and time and effort went in, not only escorting you guys, but, but also um, getting all the materials um, from Stephen, Kim, and Julie. So thank you so much for, for your effort. Mike Scarpino to, here too. Um, really appreciate all of, all of your help. Not that it matters, but thank you, DOT, for hosting. <laughs> Nobody's here really to hear that. <laughs> um, and thank you, and, Rachel. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's my pleasure. So, uh, look forward to seeing you guys soon and all the great next steps you have uh, for your subcommittees. Um, and please let us know if you want any reallocation of your subcommittees, like if you felt like you needed to be in another subcommittee or accidentally went to the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> we fixed uh, that. Please let us know. I got a real quick question, though, on that is, again, and I know you're going to send a note, but like, for example, if, if, I, if, if someone felt, if I did or someone else felt like, well, I'd love to have someone else maybe either on my team or in my membership, then you know, lend yes. their expertise to XYZ subcommittee, like, that's something I'd love guidance on and, like, when that could happen. Yes. You know, I would say happen. get me names and, like, people who are SMEs that you want to put in front of this group as soon as possible, and I will just do the double checks with GC and, like, any, any uh, I don't foresee, like, any, especially the people that are in organizations that are here already, I don't foresee any. And in fact, I think that uh, a lot of FACAs, um, many of the members even have um, people help staff the EV working group because it can get very uh, labor intensive depending on how, how, how much we uh, dive into these issues. Okay. Um, oh, you, are you guys going to send at least the top line focus areas for each group out? Like the figure? No, the, notes. the prior, the notes. From the report are. Yeah, yes, yeah, so we have everything in, um, we'll have, we have it recorded, and I think we also will provide a transcript. Uh, yes, thank you everyone who attended virtually as well. Um, we are ending the meeting.